All right, let's do this, gang. So welcome, everyone, to our second annual, second um, uh, local assistance RTPA training day. Uh, we hope to be having these on a quarterly basis moving forward because it's such a rich opportunity um, for us to share information with you and to be a part of our local assistance family. Uh, as I mentioned, we have over 400 local and regional agency partners with us today, as well as a variety of local assistance team members who are uh, in the queue to give us today's program. Um, as a reminder to put today, together today's topics, uh, we sent out a survey um, on your training needs and on your challenge areas so we could focus on them and help add value to your local project delivery programs. I'm gonna pull up the agenda now. Um, we have a very exciting agenda to hopefully meet your needs. All right, here we go. So on tap, we are going to be providing an overview of the division. We're going to be taking a deep dive into our newest program area, Clean California. We'll be talking about um, our communications and our training opportunities. And we're going to be wrapping up with some highlights from state programs on issues such as timely use of funds, uh, ATP cycle six, and our reporting requirements, as well as sharing some key takeaways on the federal aid program um, itself. Okay. But before we do, a couple housekeeping notes. First, and, and possibly most importantly, is for everyone to use the Q&A dialog box at the bottom of your screen. We're going to be dropping links to helpful resources in the chat, so keep your eye on the chat. You can go ahead and click both of those boxes and have them open on the side of your view. Um, but it's really important to remember that we are on a timed agenda today, so we might not be able to get to all of your questions. However, just like our first RTPA local assistance training day, we're going to be following up with a transcript with answers to all of the questions that you ask. We have folks monitoring the chat, but it's really the Q&A dialog box that's going to be the, the transcript to memorialize all of your questions and the answers that we provide. So please use the Q&A dialog box to ask us any clarifying questions uh, that you'd like to. And also you can use the raise hand function if you'd like to clarify any of your questions or if we need to call on you to provide any additional texture for your questions um, as we go. Um, our instructors, like I said, are gonna do their best to answer questions along the way. So please make sure that you keep your eyes peeled for the follow-up from today's events. Um, we have posted all of the media material at the Sac State LTAP portal, so you can uh, refer to these presentations uh, in the future. Um, and, and we will provide a notice of the availability of the transcript from today through the local assistance blog um, and, and venues like that that we'll talk about later in the program. Okay. Uh, Sherry, is there anything that I might have missed? No, Neil, no, we're right on schedule. All right, very good. Well, then let's just go ahead and turn it over to Don and Dee for their leadership message for us all. Don, Dee? Uh, Dee, if, if you're okay, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, and on behalf of um, the Statewide Regional Transportation Planning Agency Group, uh, I really am happy to see this second training day with so many attendees. Um, this is the, as Neil mentioned, the second local uh, assistance training day webinar, um, and it, you know, we conceive these to be regular ongoing workshops to cover really the important topics that are that are uh, rising to the top of these surveys. So you're all very, very much uh, uh, instrumental in determining the topics that we're going to be talking about. So I really want to thank local assistance again for putting this on for the regional and local agencies and their commitment to continuing this on a, a, reg a regular basis. Um, at the first training day, I, I said in my opening remarks that this experience is going to be what we all make of it. Uh, so please look for opportunities to participate. I really encourage you to use that Q&A feature um, to ask any questions that you have, because uh, I guarantee if you've got the question, someone else in the state probably has it too. Um, and then to continue participating in the surveys for future topics. So speaking kind of of what we make of this experience, um, we, we've discussed this before at the Regional Planning Agency uh, meetings, but I, for the benefit of the local agencies as well, 
Uh, if any of you have best practices or other information that you feel is important to share um, that would be beneficial for others, pe uh, feel free to re reach out to local assistance um, because we are looking for presentations and participation, not just having this be a local assistance to local agencies workshop, but a really collaborative process so that we can all uh, Im improve on our practices and make sure that um, we're learning from each other. This peer-to-peer -peer sharing is really tremendously beneficial. Um, and so I, I really uh, hope that moving forward, uh, it's not just local assistance surveying the local and regional agencies, but local and regional agencies saying, this is important and I have a great idea and or I have a project example and I might like to share it as well. Um, so please keep that in mind. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dee and really just thank everyone for being here and participating today. And thank you, local assistance. John, hi, everybody. You know, thanks for reinforcing um, the last piece of your message there. I mean, I'd like to do the same. I mean, what rise to the top and kind of the first thing off of my mind or on my mind is that collaboration. So, I mean, it's it's I think it should be a dialogue you know, almost like a peer exchange in many ways. Uh, so many different best practices, practices echoing what Don is saying across regions, across cities, across counties that we don't always get to hear about. Um, and so it helps, you know, tailor, not only tailor this um, training opportunity, but then also um, in our processes, in our procedures. I mean, I think it all, you know, comes together in many, in many ways that we can use the information. Um, that's definitely what I'd like to, you know, have you take walk away with and take home and, you know, participate in any kind of our correspondence or feedback or, you know, reviews. I mean, there's so many different ways to participate to make our program better. And how do we serve each other better? Uh, how do we, you know, provide better customer service? Um, focusing on, you know, key, key challenges. Um, so, uh, with that, I think I'd just like to extend my, my you know, deep appreciation for the local assistance team, uh, both at headquarters and in the districts. Um, this is one of many initiatives that we started over the past year, year and a half, um, as our commitment to customer service, as our commitment to outreach, engagement, training. Um, I know I've spoken on that many, many times, um, but I also want to walk the talk. And how do we get our team to be able to do that and really, you know, band together to do that. You're going to see that's multiple presentations by multiple offices, multiple staff. I'd love for, you know, all of us here on the call to participate as well with presenting down the road. Um, so that is our commitment to here to everybody here on the line as well and, and beyond. Um, so huge thank you there. Huge thank you to Don and, and Yvonne uh, for spearheading this couple years ago and saying, hey, you know, we could we could gather everybody and have these sessions. So thanks for continuing to champion those and put in such great word for this and, and you know, spreading spreading you know, the message here. Um, so with that, I hope you all walk away with um, some value um, and all your input is, is necessary and wanted. So with that, I think I'm just going to hand it over to you, Neil and team and we can get all this started. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Dee. You know, as Dee mentioned, we are really excited about this partnership. And as Dawn mentioned, you know, we're really hoping to capture and share some of your best practices, whether you're at the local agency level, the regional agency level, um, whether you're in frontline project delivery or OA management, there's lots of different parts of the local assistance process and we wanna hear from you. Okay, so um, I put my contact information in the chat. Um, please, again, as a reminder, uh, watch the chat for helpful uh, links to resources and use the Q&A dialog box to ask us any questions that you'd like to make sure that we uh, document our response to. That's all gonna be provided as a part of the, the follow-up um, package. Okay, so go ahead and open up those now, have those ready on the sidebar so you can watch the conversation as it unfolds. Okay, so then with that, I'm up. Um, the first presentation is going to be an overview of the division. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is an overview presentation of the division, right? We're going to cover who we are, why we exist, and what we do, right? Some of the things we're going to touch on is how we're structured, who our internal and external partners are, 
basically what is our purpose in regards to oversight, guidance, and some of the challenges and accomplishments that we'd like to share with you in terms of providing this support role for the California Department of Transportation, as well as all of your local agencies and regional agencies across the state. So let's get to it, okay? So probably no big surprise here. Our mission um, is to help you, um, to help our local partners deliver their transportation projects. Um, all of these projects enrich your communities, enrich our communities, enrich the state of California. So, you know, we really are partners, um, hands and gloves, so to speak, across the entire state. Okay. Um, so a little bit about how we're organized up front. Um, so we are one small part of Caltrans. Okay. We're in what's called the planning and modal programs wing. Um, as some of you may be familiar with, our different divisions are housed under different deputies, and we are in what's called planning and modal programs, um, which is with, with aeronautics, rail mass trans, transportation planning, and our research division, okay? Um, that's kind of how we are organized internally. Um, we have, as you saw, over 290 staff um, program-wide. Okay, now within the division, we have a variety of offices covering um, a, a wide variety, every program that we have, frankly. Um, I work for Kelly Hobbs over in the environmental office. Um, and we also have the offices of implementation, North and South, federal programs, state programs, guidance and oversight, um, Clean California, um, as well as our own internal um, office of resource management and business services, okay. Um, and, and this is how you can get a hold of us. Um, again, you have access to all of the presentations for today, and you can pick up the phone and give us a call at a moment's notice if you have an important issue um, that you would like to elevate um, to us working in concert, in concert with your districts, okay? Because we have 12 districts across the entire state. Um, and, and, and just like at headquarters, how we're with planning over in planning and modal programs, Similarly, if we're in the districts, um, we're frequently local assistance is housed with under the, the planning deputies, okay? So we're right next to your regional system transportation planners um, that do your PID documents for any of you that are working in partnership with on-system or on-state highway projects. Well, that's basically where we're located out at the district. And there's these really important people that hopefully you all have on speed dial. Um, these are called the district local assistance engineers. And they have a wide variety of staff um, and uh, engineers, um, admin support folks, environmental support folks to help you deliver your projects and help us deliver our program. Um, and again, you can give them a call anytime that you need to. They're what's called the, the first point of contact for you. And then they involve us here at headquarters if there's something that's at the program level or something complicated that, that they, need, they need our assistance to help sort out. But they're the, the first line as it were. Um, for you to re, uh, refer to, okay? But we also have a wide variety of other internal and external stakeholders that we work with. Um, as you might imagine, we have to deal with budgets and accounting, um, audits, right of way, structures, um, even with environmental, we have a whole other division called the Division of Environmental Analysis. And sometimes if we got a, a, a tricky challenge with environmental, we got to go see those folks. Um, and, and same thing when we're doing programming with the CTC. We go to the Division of uh, Financial Programming to help sort out a lot of those um, allocation uh, request kind of issues and, and submittal kind of request kind of issues. Okay. Um, but it's not just internally where we have partners. We have external partnerships all over the place as well. Um, these might be um, program specific advisory committees dealing with um, the HSIP um, or the bridge programs. We have the transportation cooperative committee um, or the DLAE council that's involved with all of our DLAEs all across the states. So we have a lots of different venues as Dee mentioned to hear from you and to involve you um, and your local agency representatives in our pro various process improvement efforts across the state. So if you're not familiar with any of these, um, please pick up the phone, call your DLAE, uh, learn a little bit more, um, and, and seek out opportunities where you can engage us in the process that serves you. Um, because it's really kind of important. <laughs> um, we have, this is crazy, um, over 3 billion with a B, dollars of funds that flows through this division. 
Okay, this is over 2.5 billion or uh, 2.5 billion dollars worth of federal funding, um, over 600 million dollars worth of state funding um, that all come through the division and are divvied into a wide variety of, of program areas for us to administer. Um, as you might imagine, all of these program areas, whether it's CMAC or safety, active transportation, emergency relief, I could just keep on going down this list of acronym soup here. Um, they all have their own very unique program requirements, um, submittal timeframes, um, and most importantly for you, support staff. These are people that understand, intimately understand the nuances of each of these um, funding programs, um, all of the different requirements that you'll need to adhere to when you seek funding through them. Um, and they're critically important um, support folks for you to get to know both at your district and at headquarters um, when the need arises. Okay. Um, and this is just an overview presentation. So we're not going to be getting to all of these different programs, but I think this gives you a, a a glimpse at the, the complexity behind the total amount of funds that we administer here as a division, okay? Um, and he, probably no surprise that there's a whole canon of regulatory requirement um, behind all of these funds. Um, and that's one of the big roles that, that we play is to help clarify those requirements, streamline those requirements where we can, improve our business practices, improve our data collection and reporting systems um, to make those policies and procedures um, to meet those regulatory requirements easier for you to manage as you focus on the core function of delivering the projects themselves, okay? Um, probably should be no surprise that there, there's red tape all over these funds and that's a big part of, of what we do and why we're here. Because as those state and federal funds come through the division, we play an intermediary role, okay? Um, our job is to take those funds and funnel them out through those regulations to you, the local and regional agencies, because it is complicated. And that's where we shine is to help articulate those requirements, simplify those requirements to the best of our ability, um, given state and federal le uh, legislation, so that you can do your job. And that's where we come into play, okay? Because we're kind of right in the middle of, of those worlds, so to speak, um, in between the California Transportation Commission, Federal Highway Administration, all of our regulatory partners that make sure that we follow the rules, and you guys out there, um, our customers, our partners, that you know all of these rules and regulations are maybe not your forte, and you really just need to focus on delivering the projects. And we're we're constantly in this balancing act between meeting those two needs, as it were. We're smack dab in the middle, um, trying to help you deliver your projects, trying to provide fiduciary oversight for the funds that's provided through our division. Um, and basically meet um, the intent of the lawmakers that provide these funds in the first place, okay? Um, and so we have three core functions that we do. Um, obviously, we assist you in delivering your projects. We provide oversight to make sure that the delivery process and all the rules are, uh, is going well and all the requirements are being met. And then we provide guidance to make sure that those requirements are, are clear to follow, as it were, okay? Um, and, and we do that in several different ways as we're gonna talk about through the rest of the program today, okay? Um, we actually do your op allocation authorization agreements, right? We make the money flow. Um, but when new money comes along, like Gretchen's gonna talk about with Clean California, we gotta, we gotta capitalize on those opportunities and develop new program guidelines or where there's been big changes or there are big program challenges, we have to update the guidelines um, so that, that they're easy for you to adhere to, okay? Um, we got to maintain our existing programs and take on new programs. Um, and we need to announce that to you, make sure that you're informed of, of all of the different opportunities. Um, and that's what the, the, the blog, the local assistance blog is all about, as Daniel's going to talk later in our communication and training opportunities. Um, and then we got to notify you when we flag things like projects that are um, maybe behind the eight ball on, on their, their um, project end dates um, and their delivery milestones ticking away and we're not seeing adequate progress on a project. Um, a project might go inactive. Um, 
then we need to notify you and let that let that be known um, because there's something really, really important called August redistribution. A lot of you have probably heard about, and we want to capitalize on this opportunity. Um, this is money left on the table through other states, not being able to deliver their projects efficiently. Caltrans has an amazing history of capturing August redistribution, more money for the state of California, because we do such a good job helping you guys deliver your projects. And you guys yourselves do such a great job delivering your projects um, with us. Okay. So this is how all of these functions are sort of nested in each other. Um, you know, we have policy and, and that state and federal uh, role is delegated to us as a department, as a division. And we, prefer, we perform this thing called risk-based stewardship and oversight because streamlining is huge and we don't wanna add more process on top of more process. And this is absolutely necessary. So we've taken a new philosophy in terms of administering our program and making sure that all of our requirements are being adhered to without imposing onerous um, reporting requirements um, to the best of our ability. Um, because at the core of it, when we really get down to brass tacks, we take a, a, a subset of our program and we perform audits and do performance reviews, okay? Um, and that's basically how we identify the need to course correct along the way. That's how we find out like a venue today um, where there are training needs and opportunities to safeguard the process while streamlining it at the exact same time, okay? So that's a brief snapshot of us as a division. Um, our program uh, managers for the rest of the program today are gonna be talking much more in depth about individual areas, whether it's the overview of the federal aid process, clean California, implementation state programs, uh, communication in the blog and so forth. But before we move on, uh, what I'd like to do is give you guys a snapshot of our homepage, okay? Um, I'm gonna ask somebody to put the link to our homepage um, in, the, in the chat so you can go take a look at us and bookmark us because you need to become fast friends with the resources that we provide. Um, as you can see through the snapshot here, each one of the offices that I referred to has their own homepage that has their own contact information, their own guidelines, their own trainings, their own manuals, um, each one of our offices has a wealth of information for you. Okay, so, so please come visit us. Um, and we have these two other really important manuals called the Local Assistance Program Guidelines and the Local Assistance Procedures Manual. And for anybody that works on the state highway system in partnership with Caltrans Capital Program, it's again, really important to reiterate that local assistance for off-system projects is very different than the Caltrans process for capital projects on the state highway system, okay? And so we use unique terminology and we have our own manuals, our own guidelines to help you manage and deliver your local off-system projects, okay? So again, these are references you should be intimately familiar with. Um, as Daniel's gonna talk about more, we have a blog. And we have a sign up for that so that you can remain in constant contact with us and get notifications at a, at a, at a moment's notice, um, so to speak, when there are changes to the program that you need to be aware of. Okay, so, so again, if you're interested in the training opportunities that we provide, maybe there are program specific trainings like the uh, emergency relief program. Um, or they're a, a larger training opportunity like the Federal Aid Series, which is a, a series of courses covering all aspects of local assistance, you can sign up for our trainings. And, and Sherry's going to put a link to the LTAP training registration page um, in the chat um, for you to refer to. Peruse our offerings and register. Come see us again soon. Um, LTAP is, is where our trainings are currently hosted in partnership with Sac State. Um, and we also work with um, Berkeley Transfer um, Center um, that administers the California Technical Assistance Program. So again, um, as we evolve and expand our training partnerships with other institutions, such as the, the California State University at Long Beach or the Center for International Trade and Transportation, you have a lot of opportunities to become an expert yourself. Okay. So... That's basically an overview of the department. Um, a couple of the challenges that we're addressing, and then I'll move into wrap up, um, is obviously the implementation of SB1, massive infusion of funding. Um, and it takes a lot to, to 
push that much paper <laughs> to deliver that much uh, funding um, for that many local projects. Okay. Um, we're always seeing attrition and, and rotation and movement in the, the Caltrans workforce. Caltrans is our, always hiring, great place to work if any of you are looking for a, for a new uh, role or responsibility. Um, and that comes with a, a challenge to make sure that we are planning for succession and that we're capturing the knowledge of our workforce to pass it on to tomorrow's workers. Okay. Um, in managing expectations, um, because there's a huge workload and we need to be clear with you as local agencies in terms of what we're able to deliver by when. And that's a back and forth conversation between the local agency and, and district or headquarters staff, because we understand you have a workload too. We all need to collectively manage that workload and set realistic expectations for each other. Um, and, and as you might imagine, um, that carries with it customer service expectations, customer service demands. Um, and, and we're dedicated to, through process improvement and risk-based stewardship oversight, um, meeting those needs, okay? But it is a, a, a monumental challenge to effectively manage that much funding in this many programs. Um, $3 billion is a, is a lot uh, to work for, to work with. Um, and so what we do is we have an annual publication process to address some of these challenges. Um, I've already touched on risk-based stewardship and oversight. Um, and we have several Lean Six Sigma process improvements uh, in place and currently underway. And um, we've delivered historically 100% of our OA. And in mo most recent funding cycle um, captured $120 million of August redistribution that I mentioned earlier. So these are some huge accomplishments to address some of those challenges. And I'd like to reiterate um, Dee and Don's encouragement for you to join this conversation through peer sharing some of your best practices. Um, we'd really like to hear from you. So please um, expect for us to, to give you a call. And my contact information is in the chat. So you can go ahead and get a hold of me personally and, and feed your best practice into this process so you can share and help make your peers as successful as you are. That's an overview of the division. I will pause to see if there are any questions before we move on to our next topic. And not hearing any pretty straightforward stuff there, yeah? Neil, you do have a couple of questions coming into the Q&A box. Okay, go for it. Uh, your first is, which Lean Six Sigma projects are underway? I've been eagerly awaiting streamlining of CTC allocation processes. That's great. Um, I'll tell you one that I'm aware of, and that sounds like we have a discussion topic for our next local assistance train day, process improvement. So what we're doing in environmental is working on developing a new electronic um, preliminary environmental study form that has some auto scripting of responses to and um, mistake proof and streamline the environmental preliminary environmental study intake process. Um, and CTC submittals uh, may very well be one that another office uh, can cover. Great. Your next question, um, who else do you contact if you try to contact your DLAE person and they don't get back to you? I've experienced challenges getting a hold of the DLA contact in a particular division, and it takes weeks or months to get a response. The, the best person that I would recommend if you have a communication challenge with your DLAE is your district planning deputy. That is the DLAE's supervisor. And as I mentioned, one of our challenges is attrition and changing the workforce. And we're always trying to do better to improve our responsiveness and communication. And the reason why we showed the org chart a moment ago at the district level is not just so that you have the most current DLAE and, and their phone number, but that you know who their uh, boss is, which is your district planning deputy. And for the sake of time, Sherry, let's go ahead and answer any further questions in terms of overview through the transcript that we provide after. Um, please feel free to get to know your DLAE and your district environmental staff. Maybe request a one-on-one -on -one sit down between you and your district counterparts. Um, and please watch for the transcript that we're gonna be providing um, after today's event. 
Okay, so uh, with that, next up is Peter Anderson with the Office of Implementation, who's going to be talking about the federal aid process. Uh, thank you, Neil. And just starting to share my screen here. <clears throat> Welcome to federal authorization training. This training is to assist local agencies to better understand the process of receiving the necessary approval to proceed forward with the work for their transportation projects and remain eligible for federal funding. Following this presentation will be a short quiz and a reminder, any questions you may have, please enter them into the Q&A and I'll answer as many as possible as time allows after the quiz. The question of why is there an authorization can be answered as follows. The Federal Highway Administration has the authority and responsibility for implementing and monitoring federal laws, regulations, and executive orders affecting federal transportation programs. When a project involves federal funding, FHWA is involved according to these responsibilities and delegates to Caltrans accordingly per the FHWA Caltrans Stewardship and Oversight Agreement. This authority comes from Title 23 of the U.S. Code, which requires the United States Department of Transportation, USDOT, and the state to enter into an agreement for the extent to which the state assumes project approval and oversight responsibilities for the USDOT. With authority from the oversight agreement, Caltrans has passed on these delegations to local agencies to the greatest extent possible. Prior to beginning highway work for which federal reimbursement will be requested, the project must be formally authorized by FHWA. In California, we refer to this as the E76 process or simply authorization. A project is not eligible for reimbursement until the author authorization has occurred along with a master agreement and program supplement having been executed. Topics of this training are gonna cover roles and responsibilities. Who does what? The FSTIP, the Federal Statewide Transportation Improvement Program. A project must be in the currently approved FSTIP before being eligible for federal funding. Match requirements. Federal participation varies with different programs. You need to know the maximum federal participation percentage, what it is for individual projects. The functional classification. Also, various programs require projects to be on the federal aid system. Every street and road has a functional classification. Simultaneous allocations. Some federal funds are controlled by the California Transportation Commission, the CTC. In these cases, the CTC must make an allocation prior to authorization of federal funds. Intelligent transportation system projects have some additional procedures to ensure compliance with federal requirements. The request for authorization, the RFA, is the formal process of obtaining federal approval to begin reimbursable work. A significant requirement for the RFA process is submitting the LAPM 3A, the Project Authorization Adjustment Request Form. Special conditions will address the use of at-risk PE and advanced construction. Notification of authorization is the formal reporting to local agencies from Caltrans that a project has received authorization from FHWA. Basic rules are some preliminary guidance to prevent the loss of federal funds and resources. We'll talk about the location and majority of information covered 
under this presentation. There are four significant participants in the federal aid process. FHWA, Caltrans, MPOs, and local agencies each have unique responsibilities in the authorization process. FHWA has the overall responsibility for the federal aid program. They are ultimately responsible for ensuring the financial integrity and compliance with federal laws and regulations. FHWA obligates the federal funds to individual projects. FHWA will perform program reviews. They identify high risk areas to the federal aid programs through annual risk assessments and an ongoing basis based on information gleaned through day-to-day -day interactions with Caltrans and local agencies. Caltrans is responsible and accountable to FHWA for administering the successful implementation of the federal aid program. Caltrans establishes uniform policies and procedures to assist local agencies in meeting program requirements. Working with FHWA, Caltrans interprets federal rules and regulations and provides guidance. Caltrans manages the overall program delivery and monitoring to ensure all federal funds are obligated on an annual basis. Caltrans processed E76 packages from local agencies through FHWA, prepare agreements, review invoices, and approve payments. FHWA has assigned Caltrans responsibility and authority for federal environmental review process, thus eliminating the need for a separate FHWA review of environmental documents. And Caltrans provides training to assist local agencies in planning, designing, constructing, and maintaining their transportation projects. Last, Caltrans serves as the MPO for rural counties to ensure projects are programmed into the FSTIP. The Metropolitan Planning Organizations, MPOs, have broad transportation planning duties and responsibilities for programming most projects using federal aid. They are responsible for providing each local agency with their application rules, procedures, and timelines. Local agencies have the primary responsi responsibility for implementing projects utilizing federal funds. Local agencies are responsible for nominating projects into the FSTIP, preparing the request for authorization for each project, preparing and certifying the PSNE, selecting consultants and approve consultant service contracts. They advertise and award construction projects and many, many more. As I mentioned, federal law requires projects re to receive federal funding be incorporated into the federal statewide transportation improvement program. The current 2021 FSTIP was approved April 16, 2021. This four-year document covers federal fiscal years 2021 through 2324. The FSTIP includes the rural non-MPO areas of the state and incorporates by reference the 18 individual MPO FTIPs. Key components of an FSTIP include scope of work, location of the project, project sponsor, phase, of, phase or phases of work using federal funds, program federal fiscal year, and types and amount of federal funds. The FSTIP programs projects is either individual or group projects. 
Individual projects are pro one project per listing. Federal regulations allow for projects to be grouped under a specific work function, work type, and or geographical area. They must be exempt from air conformity requirements. Project phases are programmed under construction and they must, they must have a detailed backup list of the projects that make up the group listing. This is a sample of an individual project from an MPO, in this case, MTC. This F-step listing was used for the authorization of the PE phase. The key elements mentioned previously are scope of work and location. MTC combines them into project description. Project sponsor, San Mateo County. Phases of work, federal fiscal year, and the types and amounts of federal funds. In this case, 210,000 of STP block grant funds were programmed for the PE phase in federal fiscal year 21-22. This is a sample of, F, of FSTIP listing from CTIPS the California Transportation Improvement Program system for a group listed project. Many MPOs use CTIPS as their database for managing their FTIPS. Rural counties managed by Caltrans, as I mentioned earlier, use CTIPS. In actuality, all projects are in CTIPS, but using systems like MTCs are preferred because they have designed their systems to meet their needs. Projects still have to have the basic elements of an individual project. A group de project description describes the group of projects covered by the listing. Sponsor, with a group listing, it's not unusual to see various agencies as the sponsor. But the key difference is that funding is programmed only under construction. And group listed projects are required to have a backup listing. This listing will identify the details of the individual projects, including description, project sponsor, total federal funds, and federal fiscal year. Local match. Typically, federal aid projects require a match of non-federal funds. The federal share is generally 80%, but is subject to the upward sliding scale adjustment for states containing public lands. California's federal share rate increases to 88.53%. Individual programs have some individual programs have higher reimbursement rate, such as HSIP, which has a 90% federal share. A 100% federal share is possible with various programs, such as HSIP control measures, some discretionary programs, or projects utilizing toll credits. FHWA fact sheets on individual programs define the federal share. To utilize toll credits, the project or project phase must have a reimbursement rate of 100% excluding non-participating costs and clearly be identified in the F-STIP. The roadways are, are grouped based upon the character of travel they provide into functional classification. The functional classification of a route is used to determine federal eligibility. An example of this is projects that utilize STP block grant funding. These projects must be on the federal aid system with some exceptions, such as bike and pedestrian projects. The functional classification of a route is broken down to either on or off the federal aid system. On the federal aid, includes interstates, other freeways and expressways, other principal arterials, minor arterials, major collectors. Off the federal aid system is minor collectors and rural roads. 
If there is uncertainty as to the classification of a particular route, Caltrans maintains a GIS database showing functional classification. The website shown here takes you to the California road system maps. And shown here is the opening page to the California road system maps. It is best viewed using either Chrome or Firefox. This GIS mapping system has various layers of information, including the functional classification and other layers of importance. Legislative congressional districts, Caltrans districts, and the California Road System CRS map grid. These are elements required when completing the LAPM 3A project authorization adjustment request form. There is a search function to assist in locating a route and to determine the functional classification. You may enter a route by name only or add a city name to narrow the search. You may enter an intersection by naming the two roadways. For example, everyone knows Lombard Street in San Francisco. Its intersection with Hyde Street is world famous. The results bring us to the location we seek. To verify the route classification, click on this icon and the functional values are displayed. Lombard Street is a local road. Hyde Street is a major collector. The maps shown on previous section, you can zoom down to individual streets. For projects that require an allocation of federal funds by the CTC, for example, STP or ATP, it is recommended that the allocation and authorization requests be submitted concurrently. The District Local Assistance Engineer, DLAE, will review both packages for completeness and accuracy. If they are both complete and accurate, the DLE will submit them to headquarters Office of Implementation simultaneously within the CTC's published preparation schedule. There will be a focus on the allocation request to ensure that the request makes the CTC deadline for inclusion on the meeting agenda. Authorization of federal funds will not occur until the CTC has taken action and allocated the federal funds. The simultaneous process will prevent any delay of authorizing the federal funds after the CTC has made the allocation and minimize the impact to timely use of funds deadlines. Chapter 25 of the Local Assistance Program Guidelines covers a broad spectrum of necessary guidance and information regarding to working with the CTC programs and obtaining an allocation. The designing and development of ITS projects represents a paradigm shift in the engineering mindset compared to traditional highway projects. ITS projects may not have a clear break between the preliminary engineering phase and construction phase. The pro these projects may not have a traditional construction phase and may not be suitable for low bid construction contracts. The nature of the engineering development of these projects also implies a greater risk of uncertainties for, for, complete, for successful completion. The application and oversight process of ITS projects is different in some significant ways from traditional roadway construction process. Because of this difference, many ITS projects have not been successful. 
This is especially true of ITS projects that involve something new, which the lead agency has not done before. This might include new technology, new software, new communications, or joint efforts with new partners. Because of the high risk of failure for certain ITS projects, the use of system engineering is required to help mitigate these risks. When an ITS project is added to the FSTIP, the lead agency makes a preliminary classification of the project as exempt, low risk, or high risk. If a project is determined as exempt, then the project proceeds exactly the same as for tr a traditional roadway project. For projects classified as low or high risk, the local agency prepares and submits a system engineering review form, SURF, with the initial funding request. Based on the answer supplied on the SURF, the project is classified as either low risk or high risk. For low risk projects, the remainder of the process is exactly the same as a traditional roadway project. For high risk projects, a system engineering plan, a SEMP, must be completed early in the process to help manage the detailed system design, implementation, and testing. The SURF of high risk ITS projects must be approved by FHWA prior to or shortly after initial authorization. Development of the SEMP is contingent upon federal approval of the SURF. An FHWA approval of the SEMP is required before proceeding to detail, com detail component design. Prior to beginning work for which federal reimbursement will be requested, the project phase must be formally authorized or approved by FHWA. The project sponsor identified in the FSTIP to receive the federal funds is responsible for requesting the federal authorization to proceed. The project sponsor must prepare and submit the request for authorization package to the appropriate DLAE, which should include as, as a minimum, the agency's LAPM 3A and all required supporting documents. Individual requests for authorizations are required for each phase. The PE phase includes environmental and ps &E. The right-of-way phase may include utility relocation and construction may include construction engineering. The request for authorization starts with the LAPM 3A the Re Project Authorization Adjustment Request Form. This form is used for all phases and any amendments to existing authorized phases. Shown here is the LAPM 3A. I will take you step-by-step step in filling, out, filling it out for a preliminary, engineer, preliminary engineering authorization request. Each appropriate field needs to be completed and any omissions <clears throat> may lead to the request being rejected and returned to the local agency. The date field serves as a reference of when an agency begins the request for authorization process. If for any reason the 3A is updated, this date needs to be updated too to allow those working and reviewing to know which version is the latest. Federal project number is assigned by the DLA and is used for tracking the project. 
agency is the project sponsor. Project sponsor. Select the Caltrans district where the project is primarily located. Select the congressional district where the project is located. You may use the MULT, the MULT, for projects in more than one legislative district. If a project is in multiple congressional districts, use the remarks section at the bottom of the form to enter the individual legislative districts with est the estimated cor corresponding percentages of the distribution of work between the legislative districts. Project contact. Enter the name of the primary contact. This is who the DLE will reach out to for questions regarding this request for authorization. This includes their title, email, and phone number. Project title, just a simple description of the project. If the project involves a bridge, the form will automatically add a section to add bridge numbers. Project location. Describe the physical location and limits of the project. Describe the description of work. Describe the major components of work. The project location and scope of work needs to be consistent with the F-STIP. Any work that is not part of the FSTIP is ineligible for federal reimbursement. Functional classification as defined from the California road system maps. If the project is on different functional classification, use the highest level and in the remarks section, identify the other routes, identify the individual routes and their classifications. Check this box if you're dealing with a project on the state highway system. As I mentioned in the mapping, the CRS map coordinates is a required field to be entered and can be obtained from the mapping systems. Again, if the project involves ITS, ITS, enter, select the level of risk. Select who is delegated authority to administer the project. Majority of the projects we deal with are locally administered. One critical date is the project end date. The period of performance is defined as the date when FHWA authorizes a project agreement to begin incurring costs for the identified phase and scope of work. The initial E76 authorization establishes the start date for the period of, of performance for the applicable work phase. The project end date is the date that the agency must estimate to identify the end of the project's period of performance. Project end date is defined as the date after which no additional costs may be incurred. Any costs incurred after the PED will not be eligible for federal reimbursement. Upon adding future phases of work or for unseen delays, the PED must be revised. I mean, revising the PED retire, requires Caltrans concurrence and FHWA approval. So the PED is established based on the completion of a particular phase of work being authorized. For right away, completion of the phase is based on the estimated, com estimated construction advertisement date. For construction projects, Completion is estimated as the board or council's construction contract acceptance. Non-infrastructure is similar to construction and acceptance of the final project. The PED, project end date, 
is established by adding 12 months to the estimated date of completing the phase. Invoicing needs to be submitted within 120 calendar days of the PED for FH, FHWA to consider it eligible for reimbursement. Again, work performed after the PED is not eligible for reimbursement. When you enter the estimated phase completion date, in this case, March, 2023, the PED is automatically calculated by adding 12 months. Continuing on the LAPM 3A, what phase of work is being requested for in this example, PE? One last field to, to be completed in this section is the project is the project invoking section 1440 at risk PE. We will be discussing this option later in this presentation. For this example, we are not utilizing at risk PE. The next section to be completed is the project funding. Based on the phase of work being authorized, the form auto automatically adds the appropriate components. For simplicity, this section has already been filled out. Here are the key pieces of information to be entered. The federal fund type, the amount of federal funds, the amount of non-federal funds, whether they are state, local, or other, the total cost is automatically calculated based off of federal funds and non-federal funds. Of the total cost, is the entire amount federally eligible? If not, the project sponsor needs to identify the non-participating amounts in the remarks section of this form. The reimbursement ratio is automatically calculated based on the federal amount divided by the federal participating costs. Federal regulations require the federal share of eligible project costs to be established at the time of authorization as either pro rata or lump sum. Pro rata, the federal share will be defined as a specific percentage. Lump sum, the federal share will be, term, be defined as a specific dollar amount, not to exceed the legal federal share. For projects at the maximum reimbursement rate, there is no difference between selecting pro rata or lump sum. But if the project is underfunded below the maximum reimbursement ratio, do not use pro rata. Lump sum is the preferred choice. The federal amount requested is based on the federal funds inputted on the form. If the project is utilizing toll credits, then this box is clicked. Department policy requires that the phase being authorized as 100% federal participating to be eligible federal for toll credits. And the F-STIP must clearly identify the use of toll credits. Based on the phase requesting authorization on the LAPM, the form identifies the supporting documents to accompany the LAPM 3A. The items that are checked are absolutely required. Those with a dot are required if applicable. Per federal requirements, a local agency must designate a full-time public employee in responsible charge for each project. The role of responsible charge is to ensure 
that the work delivered under contract is complete, accurate, and consistent with the terms, conditions, and specifications of the contract. The responsible charge must be employed directly by the local agency receiving the federal funds. A consultant cannot be designated as responsible charge for a project. And the project contact person does not need to be the responsible charge. And as mentioned earlier, some sections of the LAPM 3A require additional information. And at the very bottom of the form is the remarks section for entering this information. There are two special conditions that we need to address as part of this training. Section 1440, at-risk PE and advanced construction. These two special conditions have additional requirements from standard authorizations. Section 1440 of the FAST Act, the prior Transportation, uh, Transportation Act, authorizes FHWA to reimburse recipients and subrecipients for preliminary engineering costs incurred prior to project authorization, assuming the costs are for eligible activities on eligible projects. This only applies to the PE phase. Planning, right-of-way, and construction phases are not eligible. When utilizing at-risk PE, the project must be in a federally approved FSTIP. If the project is eligible for at-risk PE, the agency may seek reimbursement back to the effective date of the FAST Act, which was October 1st, 2015, or the federally approval date of the FSTIP when the project was first programmed, whichever occurred later. When referencing the initial FSTIP, the PE funds are not required to be programmed as federal funds. But at the time of authorizing the at-risk PE, the PE funds must be federally programmed. Other than an agency receiving an authorization for PE, all federal requirements must be met. The local agency must follow federal procedures in the consultant selection and procurement process. They must submit a LAPM 9A, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Implementation Agreement when consultants are used. And to be eligible for indirect costs, the agency must receive an approval letter of the indirect cost rate proposal prior to billing for indirect costs. The at-risk policy does not eliminate the need to adhere to CTC policy and guidelines. The CTC guidelines state that a phase is not eligible for reimbursement until the funds have been allocated. You may invoke at-risk PE after the CTC has allocated federal funds. And SB 184 may allow for reimbursement in advance of the actual allocation. And NEPA environmental review may begin without demonstrating full funding of the project in the F-STEP. However, full funding for subsequent phases must be included in the F-STEP before NEPA can be signed. To seek reimbursement for retro retroactive PE expenditures, an agency must submit a request for authorization invoking section 1440 at risk. Three additional pieces of information are required from a standard PE authorization. One, the first date PE was approved in the FSTIP. This establishes the earliest date to be eligible for retroactive reimbursement. 
to the estimated cost that occurs under 1440 at risk. This is an estimate of expenditures that occurred during the period of at risk. And three, the estimated date of at, end date of at risk PE. If you are still in the PE phase, the at risk ends with the processing of an at risk authorization, assuming you're still continuing with PE phase. If in the construction phase, the at risk would end with the construction advertisement date. Just to let you know, the cost and end date are only estimates. We do not have to have exact numbers. When federal funds are not available for obligation due to insufficient balance of funds or obligation authority, a local agency may request in writing federal authorization to proceed with the project phase under advanced construction procedures. This written request is in the submittal of the LAPM 3I, Request for Local Advanced Construction Authorization. Under advanced construction procedures, following the, following the federal authorization, the local agency will use its own funds to perform work eligible for future reimbursement. The local agency must have sufficient local funds to pay for all project costs until such a time as federal funds become available. Federal procedures must be followed in order to remain eligible for reimbursement. The local agency must consider the risk that, a federal, that federal funds may never become available and that advanced construction does not constitute a commitment of federal funds to the project. No PSA will be executed or updated with advanced construction authorization. The processing of the, the authorization to convert advanced construction to real funds may be restricted to when funds are available. If and when federal funds become available, a follow-up request for authorization must be processed to obligate federal funds and place the funds under agreement with FHWA. The program supplement agreement between Caltrans and local agency will be executed or updated after authorization to allow the local agency to invoice for, invoice for work that has occurred. The LAPM 3I is the written request from a local agent that they are willing to advance forward on a project utilizing their own funds prior to federal funds being authorized. The agency needs to identify the phase utilizing advanced construction. Indicate the reasons for justification for requesting advanced construction and it needs to be signed by a representative of a local agency that has the authority to commit local funds. This does not need to be the responsible charge person. The use of advanced construction is noted on the LAPM 3A. When it comes to the project funding on the LAPM 3A, it is completed the same way as if federal funds were actually being authorized. What are the differences between at-risk PE and advanced construction? Advanced construction may be used for any phase of work for the project while at-risk PE only applies to the PE phase. After FHWA authorizes advanced construction, a project can move forward with local funds. At-risk PE may begin before federal authorization and no prior approval is required. 
Federal eligible costs incurred after advanced construction are eligible for reimbursement. At-risk PE costs are eligible for reimbursement based on the date the project based on the date that PE was first in the F-STIP. Both require FHWA authorization before reimbursement may begin. Once FHWA has authorized a project, local, local assistance will notify the local agencies. The DLA will make the initial formal notification that FHW has approved the request for authorization. Headquarters, Division of Local Assistance Office of Project Implementation will follow up the district notification with a finance letter and program supplement if necessary. The district notification will include the project authorization agreement summary. This report will identify the project by federal project number, location, type of work. The phase approved along with prior approved phases and the project end date. The notification will include approval dates and the official authorization date by FHWA. Reimbursable work may begin the following day after FHWA authorization approval. Headquarters Office of Project Implementation will transmit to the local agencies a finance letter generated from our data system LP2000. The finance letter will contain some of the same information as the project project authorization agreement summary, federal project number along with the project end date, the phases, federal funds and appropriation codes. The reversion date. The reversion date is based on state budgetary law. Funds are available to expend against up to the reversion date. If an agency cannot fully liquidate authorized funds by the reversion date, the agency may apply for a cooperative work agreement to extend the liquidation period for up to two years. Some basic rules. For any project financed with federal funds, no matter which phase, the project is subject to comply with the provisions of NEPA, the Uniform Relocation Act, and Buy America. If $1 of, of federal funds is utilized on a local assistance project, the entire project is to be covered by the NEPA process. The scope of NEPA is not determined based on funding the low. The NEPA document must cover the entire project, even segments that are non-participating. For right-of-way, the Uniform Relocation Act must be followed on all federal assistant, assistance projects, even if no federal funds are being used for the acquisition of right-of-way on the project. And for all federal aid construction projects, regulations require that all manufacturing processes involving steel or iron must occur within the United States. Buy America provisions do allow, to, do allow for a minimal use of foreign, mater, foreign materials if less than 2,500 or 0.1% of the contract amount, whichever is greater. Prior to beginning highway work for which federal reimbursement will be requested, the project phase must be formally authorized by FHWA. Each federally funded phase requires a separate authorization. Any work performed prior to authorization is not eligible for federal reimbursement, excluding the at-risk PE. For construction, 
federal authorization must be received prior to advertising. Projects advertised for construction contract prior to federal authorization are not eligible for federal funds. You must obtain authorization before you advertise. A handout is to be, should be included as supplement material for this, for this training titled 12 procedural errors that can result in the loss of federal transportation funds. We refer to this as the dirty dozen. This is a list of 12 areas that includes the more common problems that are reoccurring on federal aid projects, which can result in the loss of federal funding. Much of the material presented today is directly from local assistance manuals. If you need more information, please re review the appropriate chapters and do not hesitate to contact your DLA. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Like I say, right. I, Felicia will now handle the quiz. And like I said, <laughs> after, after the quiz, I'll take a look at the question and the answers uh, that are in the uh, being posted and we'll answer as many as we can after the quiz. And so I will pass off this to Felicia. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, while Peter's looking over the Q&A, give him a chance to answer those questions. I think that's totally doable in the time frame. I'm going to give everyone a quiz. Um, and you all thought you were just going to show up and just sit here. We got some things for you here. So I'm going to open the polls. My name is Felicia Haslam. I'm the Office Chief of Project Implementation North. So I'm going to launch the poll now. You'll have a series of questions. I think we got 15 questions. I'll give you about 30 seconds to answer the question. It will be multiple choice. Um, answer how you feel best fit to answer, and we will see. So you should see a poll come up right now. Um, feel free to start answering. I will also read the question. Um, you should see the poll pop up on your screen, and I see woo, you guys are going at it. So which agency is responsible? For developing the PSNE package for a federal aid construction project. And remember, we try to delegate everything we can to the local agencies. We really want agencies to have that authority um, and responsibility over their projects. Okay, I am going to end the poll right now. So most people answered 88% local agency. Yes. The local agency. Question number two. Federal authorization process. And remember when Peter went over this, a project must be included in the current FSTIP prior to federal funds being authorized by FHWA. So this is one of our number one requirements. I am going to end the poll right now. Yes. So most people know that is true. Yes, must be in a uh, program in the FSTIP in order to have funds authorized. Question number three. Group listed projects in the FSTIP require a backup listing. Might be a little tricky question, but if you have a group of projects listed in the FSTIP, we're going to ask you. Possibly. And as was mentioned just in the uh, chat, please use the Q&A feature for your questions. That's where we're looking. We're not looking in chat to answer the Q&A. So we're looking in the Q&A. If you have a question in chat, please transfer it over. I'm going to end the poll now. That is true. If you have a group of listed projects, we need the backup listing um, to verify that. Oh, did I share the results? There we go. That is true.
Okay, for a standard CMAC or SDBGP, the old SDP or ATP project, the federal participation percentage is without toll credits would be, and we are in California. So Peter mentioned what California's uh, percentage is versus maybe uh, the base percentage. So in California, what is our max reimbursement ratio without toll credits? Because toll credits allow you to have 100%, right? Um, <clears throat> All right, I'm going to end that. 8853, yes, good job. So remember it's 8853. Most of your projects are gonna have that unless they are um, unless they have a different formula, which they could. Okay, for route classifications, funding is used on certain um, certain routes so check all routes that apply to a federal aid system, all route classifications. So what could your project be funded if it's on a certain type of road? There's a couple types of road, probably not gonna um, have funding on it. Click all that apply. All right, all right, all right. I'm gonna end the poll, share the results. So the, quick, the correct answer is A through E. Yes, all of those roads, minor collectors, local roads, not so much. So those we don't um, usually recognize on a federal aid system. Um, they normally don't get federal aid funds. So you have to have a certain classification. Hopefully I didn't miss a question. Okay, federal ATP funds can be authorized prior to the CTC allocation. I think there was a, a note in the Q&A. This is, hey, Caltrans makes a determination. Peter will um, maybe answer that here in a minute. But for in general, federal ATP funds can be authorized prior to CTC allocation. I'm going to... in the poll right now. That is false. So you have to have them allocated by the CTC. That is a requirement that we have um, as of right now. Okay, next question. High risk intelligent transportation system projects, ITS require FHWA to approve both the system engineering review form, the SURF, and the systems engineering management plan. True or false? ITS, little special projects. Looks like that one's pretty easy for people. That is true. So if you have ITS project, you'll expect that FHMUA will be looking at those documents. Okay, at a minimum, a local agency only needs to submit the project authorization adjustment request form, which we call LAPM3A, to initiate requests for authorization. Now, someone talked about streamlining earlier um, and the Lean Six. This is one of our streamlining efforts, and I think it's a really cool form. That's what I hear um, from others as well. It's a smart form, it uh, expands, it's dynamic based on your needs. So we do try to um, pick out forms like this and make them a little more user friendly. Um, but is the only thing you need is the 3A to us. Although it has a lot of information on it, critical information, necessary information. I'm gonna end the poll right now. And remember it says only needs to submit the project authorization. I'm gonna say that one's false because we need the backup documentation that goes with that, or at least the district does. So we're required to look at certain documentation. As Peter mentioned, we are delegated. 
the oversight authority by FHWA. So we have certain requirements that we are required to check. Um, and those documents that go along with the 3A are those um, minimum checks that we see. Okay, reimbursable costs are federally eligible um, for reimbursement if the work occurred after the project end date. True or false? Now we did a lot of outreach um, on this, this last year on the project end date. And is that showing up? Because I don't see anyone answering. Cold disappeared. Uh oh, I see it on my end. <laughs> I so see it too. You see it? Yes, I do. Hmm. Cherry. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Do, yeah, so they can't see the poll. I see it. Peter sees it. So maybe the panelists can link. Oh, oh, here we go. I see people answering now. Okay. So maybe it just popped back up. All right. Um, reimbursable costs are federally eligible for reimbursement if the work occurred after the project end date. So project end date's pretty significant, right? Beware of this date. And hopefully everyone knows of the project end date, the PED tool that we have created. Um, I want to say kudos and thank you so much to Don and Ryan for sending that out. I've had several agencies um, say that you sent it out and encourage them to use it. And they think it's a pretty good uh, tool to be using. So I appreciate everyone using that. Yes, please use that tool. Check your project end date because if you have costs or work that occurred after the project end date, it's, they're not um, reimbursable costs. FHWA will not reimburse us. We will not reimburse you. Um, so you have to do work within that project end date. It needs to be extended. Um, please look at that PED tracker um, and get it extended in a timely fashion um, with a justification. So good job everyone on that one. That's a really important date. All right. If a project phase is federally underfunded, the appropriate reimbursement method is, I think Peter stressed this one. If you had a choice, sometimes you don't have a choice, but most of the time you do. I'm going to end the poll right now. So it's actually lump sum. Choose lump sum. Choose lump sum. You have more option. It benefits you. But sometimes it's not possible. You have to use pro rata. But if you don't, yep, lump sum. Um, that could save you some, some stress and some cash in the end. OK. Okay, a local agency needs federal approval to begin a project using at-risk PE. Hmm, so at-risk PE, it's relatively new. It's kind of a slick option for agencies. Um, so do you need federal approval in order to begin the, um, using at-risk PE? Is that true or false? And we do have information now on this. It's in our LAPM, it's been updated. Um, we had an office bulletin, but it's been incorporated into the LAPM. So if you need more info on this one, um, check it out in the LAPM. Um, I'm going to end the poll. Okay. So this one, most people said yes, true. Um, it's actually false. So maybe it's a misleading question. So at risk BE, uh, as long as your project is um, programmed in the FSTIP uh, with some funding, local funds, um, could be local funds. You can start work on that. You don't need federal approval to begin work on it. Um, it's just at some point you'll need to come in and invoke that at-risk PE um, and and um, let us know what your original FSTIP date was that had the local funds that you now um, put in federal funds for that. So at-risk is a, is a little different. It's different than AC, where AC you need to have it programmed and have your AC approved, right? At-risk PE, you can be doing work right now on a project that has at-risk PE as long as it's programmed. Um, just remember though, uh, when you come in that you follow the correct regulations, that might be a question. So maybe I'm giving you some answers. I better share the, share the outcomes. So a lot of people said 
Yeah, it's true. It's actually, you can begin at-risk PE prior to federal approval. That's the beauty of at-risk PE. Okay, when utilizing at-risk PE, local procedures may be utilized in the hiring of consultants and other PE work. Now remember, it's a benefit. You can use at-risk PE. You can be using it right now, but when you come in, to get authorized to say, hey, I'm going to seek reimbursement for that, we will have expected you because it is federal reimbursement, right? Not to give you the answer, but want to make sure you understand. All right, I'm going to end the poll right now. So that one is actually false. Ooh, that's 60 40 split. So that's actually false. When if you use at risk PE, you're still required to follow federal regulations. That is a risk um, that both of us take, right? So we're um, oversight authority for FHWA. They expect their regulations to be followed. We pass that on to the local agency. So that is a risk um, that we are taking, that you are taking. Um, we're expecting you to make sure you follow federal regulations. So I would suggest if you have any um, intention of being federally reimbursed and you know later down the road, um, even if you don't know later down the road, follow your federal requirements because if that's in the FSTIP and you expect to get um, reimbursed, we will check that to make sure you followed federal regulations. Okay, an agency that receives an authorization using advanced construction may seek immediate reimbursement for prior work. So if you're going to AC, advanced construction, your project um, that allows you to start work, All right, I'm going to share the results. False, that is false. So you have to have it converted because it's not really, it's kind of a placeholder. It's not really a federally authorized project until you get it converted, right? So it although allows you to begin work in order to get reimbursed, you'll need to have that AC converted. But keep in mind when you go to convert it, be ready to invoice because sometimes you'll pop up on the inactive list. Um, and then yeah, that's no good either, right? So we want to keep you off the inactive list. So when you're ready to convert, be ready to invoice as well as what we request. Almost there. The official notification to proceed is issued by the, is it FHWA, HQ, local assistance, your DLAE, or your MPO? Remember who your peeps are, your number one, your number one fans. You're going to work closely with them. And this might be a trick question too. <laughs> so Peter might have some explaining to do on this chosen question here. <laughs> there might not be any uh, really wrong answer, but there are some, there is a preferred one. <laughs> when you receive something, who are you going to receive it from? Maybe not who issued it, but who's gonna re who are you gonna receive it from? So I'm gonna end the poll on that one. I'm gonna share the results. So I think Peter went over, you're gonna receive it from your DLAE. Um, although it, it is an official notice to proceed or a, an official E76. Well, it does say notice to proceed. So it may come from FHWA, but you're gonna get it from your DLAE. So you should be getting those from your DLAE. And I think this is our last question. Headquarters local assistance will issue to the local agency after federal authorization. What do we issue you? Uh, is it a notice, copy of the notice to proceed, a finance letter, a sign accepted, LAPM 3A. Remember, this is HQ local assistance, FHWA approval letter. Let's see if y'all are paying attention. All right, so I'm going to end that poll. It is, yes, 
the finance letter. So HQ will be sending you a finance letter that is signed by our area engineers. This is what you're going to use to get reimbursed. Uh, the reimbursement ratio is on there, the funding codes. Uh, make sure you understand those funding, the program codes, because that's what you're going to put on your invoice. Um, we do expect those to be charged correctly. Um, there's a whole process with that um, that we need to follow as well. So um, finance letter. Okay. So, so not only are these polls fun, um, not, all, not only are those polls fun, but they really help us course correct and fine tune our training over time. Um, Peter's got about 20 minutes left and he's gonna take a look at the questions that you all put in the Q&A box. And, and as you might imagine, we've got a ton of them. There's 14 of them in there. Uh, different members of this team are gonna try to answer different questions related to our specialty. Um, he's gonna take a stab at them based on the time that he has left. And we're gonna follow up with all y'all with written responses to those questions, as well as circling back on some of the questions that were answered orally so that they're in the transcript that we're gonna provide you after today's course. Peter? Yeah, before I go into the questions, I wanna explain a little bit on the lump sum per rata choice. And this goes to a real life example of a project I, was, I dealt with um, where the project was underfunded it was under and it was identified as pro rata and it has 75 percent reimbursement ratio so all the reimbursement would be done at 75 percent when the pro, when the project was over and done with it had savings of about two hundred thousand dollars total and since the project was done using Pro rata, only a, of that two hundred thousand dollars savings, one hundred fifty thousand of that was federal funds. If it had been established as a lump sum, that two hundred thousand dollars savings would have been a hundred percent federally funded. So there was fifty thousand dollars of local funds that end up being put on this project that didn't need to be there. And so that's it. That's, that's a real life. I mean, so that local funds could have been applied to other transportation projects. Granted, the federal funds that, um, that were not used were eligible to go elsewhere and used on other transportation projects. But if you as a local agency, you have total control over those funds they go back to, the, like I said, typically go back to the MPO and they may program. And that those savings that were, uh, could have been used, which were not, get programmed to possibly other projects elsewhere and not to your own individual project. So that's a real life example of why you have to be careful. And so the simple thing is when in doubt, use lump sum. So quickly going through some of the questions. Some of them, there are some questions uh, I can answer right off the bat, might require some. So the first question is just going to summarize it. They were dealing with a project, with an ATP project, but it's not federal funded. I, so the simple fact, what we've been talking about, the 3A and everything here, is applies only to federal aid projects. So dealing with state funded projects, no, ignore pretty much everything I talked about here today. Um, local agency, we do not belong to ACEC. I'm not sure what AC. Um, we need to have some heads up on programming changes, the uh, heavy workload. Uh, it's not really a question there. Um, if you're lot, constantly want updates on our Doc, our information, we'll have a session coming up here in a little bit about our blog and email notification system. Highly recommend signing up for those to get updates as to changes in the federal program or even anything through local service, both federal and state programs. Uh, advance. My screen's jumping around. I'd like to point out nuance about one slide. Project funds, CTC, allocation used in advanced construction. Um, when we're dealing with a federal project and the CTC, 
The key here is CTC guidelines establish as eligible, eligible for reimbursement based on the date the CTC allocates the funds. So trying to utilize um, advanced construction or PE at risk, um, you still have to be get that CTC allocation to be eligible. And so it doesn't matter if the project was in the FSTIP prior to that, the CTC allocation date establishes it. The SB 184 pretty much allows you to, allows the CTC to grant approval to back to like the beginning of the state fiscal year, which would be July 1st. Um, and so you have to submit and get approval from the CTC about utilizing SB 184. And so, um, and then when the allocation is made, it recognizes that as, and so you can be eligible back. So that's about the earliest an allocation, anything that's allocated by the CTC is back to uh, July 1st. Uh, cooperative agreements. Cooperative agreement is between Caltrans and the state for typically for projects that involve the state highway system. And so we have to have a cooperative agreement or an equivalent document when we are dealing with projects on the state highway system. They are independent of the federal aid process pretty much other than we want to make sure that a cooperative agreement has been executed prior to authorizing federal funds. So the, just in, in kind of a summary, cooperative agreement will say who does what, who's responsible for doing the work and also has a funding plan. And that funding plan should be consistent with how we're authorizing funds. Somebody asked the question, current guidelines for toll credits. It's in chapter three of our LAPM. It has toll credits in there. Um, pretty much explain what, what, where toll credits are available. Individual MPOs may also have some individual requirements uh, that go above and beyond our policies. So um, we dictate where, when it can be used. We don't pretty much have, we have just some minor limitations and some bridge and some safety requirements, but um, it's up to then the MPO to concur with it. And they said they may have some additional requirements. So that's an area you need to talk to them. Um, NEP, is NEPA required for ARPA funds used? And it says Neil's typing an answer. So Neil, can you answer? I'm not sure what ARPA funds are. Yeah, I started typing an answer and dealing with some tech issues on the back end here. Um, that is basically related to the question right after about NEPA, if I understand correctly. So the bottom line is, I'll type this out here in a second, is um, NEPA is required anytime there is a federal nexus, which is federal funds, federal permits, um, encroachment upon federal lands, et cetera. So if there's a federal nexus, then NEPA is required. Thank you. Somebody asked, would you complete the LAPM 3A for earmark projects? Um, we are utilizing the 3A for any project that involves federal funds that are gonna be authorized through our standard federal authorization process. So under the fund types, um, we do know, know some new additional programs are kind of coming in. Some of the ones that are mentioned here, like TSEP, that's local, like I said, those are not, um, those are dealing with some um, state funds. And so once again, if the state funds are being used as the match requirement for federal funds, you would identify the federal funds on that on the form on the 3A. You would put the state funds in, on the uh, as the match under the state section, and then it might be, be behoove in the remark section to state 
that the state funds are from what program. And again, if it requires a CTC allocation, uh, kind of we would not want to do the authorization until the funds have been allocated by the CTC, whether they are accept, if they're being used as the match. This is a good question. And this is one that still hasn't been clarified is utilizing PE at risk with bridge program. The way the bridge program has, has things programmed, I started working with them and it's kind of been put on the back shelf, but it's something that does need to be picked up again. And so we don't have an exact answer about how to utilize PE at risk for bridge projects. Um, in, in reality, that when the project is initially listed in the F step, uh, you're, you're, at, you, you're starting with, you're utilizing your own local funds with it. And like bridge funds are programmed in a particular fiscal year. So that once they're programmed, then yes, you should be able to start utilizing, um, utilizing your own funds until a time that they're eligible to be allocated again or authorized against because bridge funds are pretty restrictive in terms of the fiscal years that they are programmed. So, um, so like I said, it got to, we, we do need to we do need to get some clarification on the on the at risk policy regards to bridge, but um, it should be doable. We just want, we, we do need to supply uh, some better guidance in that regards. Uh, somebody asked to request a copy of the Dirty Dozen. We'll make sure that's available. And through the LTAP people, we'll have that and hopefully have it available to be posted. Somebody asks, how does a project get into the F step without federal approval? Well, uh, um, the F step is the first part of the federal process of getting federal authorization. So um, the way you can't get, you, you know, the answer is simple. You can't get federal author approval without being the F step. The F step process, um, like I said, there's two, two components of it for the rules. Go into the MPO through the, like I said, through Caltrans, the MPOs for the 18 individual MPO areas, they'll, projects will go to them and they will enter the projects. Um, and then they go forward for approval. If an approval ultimately would be by FHWA. If we're dealing with amendments to the F step, there's two types of amendments, administrative and formal. Administrative amendments uh, can be done, approved by uh, most of the MPOs. I think of, of the 18 MPOs, 17 have, have delegated, they've been delegated the authority to approve administrative amendments, but it is a process that requires them to make, a, make a, an amendment. If it's a formal amendment, and the difference is, is involves the level of change of what project is doing. If you're adding a new project into the into the F, F, F step, that is a formal amendment. And that will require approval starting with the MPO, then it'll go to Caltrans and ultimately approved by FHWA and FTA. So they approve both the formal amendments are approved by both. Is the, is the right of way cert required for construction? And the answer to that is yes. Um, if in some, in the question, consider part of the PE phase or right of way phase. The right of way certification is part of the right of way phase. It's the ultimate final approval of saying the right of way has been cleared. Um, all 
all the permits, all the um, parcels, et cetera. So it is part of the right-of-way phase and it's up to the agency to determine whether they want to um, seek reimbursement for that phase and have to have a program. There is some preliminary right-of-way work that can be done during the PE phase. For example, some preliminary mapping uh, can be done. But it's once again, it's up to individual agencies to make the determination if they want to seek reimburse, federal reimbursement for the author that, for the for the right of way phase, such that when they go to get their right of way certification, that they are eligible to seek re federal reimbursement. So there's some PE. So PED is a function of the phase. Correct. The answer is that, yes. PED is is established based on the phase of work that's being authorized. Um, so we'll start with the PE phase and establish the PE PED based off of PE based on the estimated date of advertisement of the project, and then we said we add twelve months to it. So if there's a little delays that occur during that part the PED should still be good. And then when you come forward for construction, because you know, if you're doing the right of way, the right of way would have the same PED during that time period. When you come forward for construction, then we would take that PED and just move it out and have establish a new date now from, and so that any stuff, there was still some preliminary engineer work that was occurring, it's still eligible because it still fell within that PED even, and then the new date that it gets moved out. So it's important to know what your PED is. And like I said, we have a tool now for determine, check verifying it, um, but track that PED to make sure, because if you start having significant delays, and that's it, it's a delay of a year, then you, you do need to look at, you know, at moving that date out. Next part, right away certification. Once again, um, the difference between um, let's say ATP, it says ATP requires local agencies to file a 13B. We have two right away certs. We have what's called, we refer to the short form, sh short form versus the long form and right away certifications. If the short form can be used as long, if there is no right away acquisition, no easements, the only, only thing that can be part of that would be is some utility uh, covered adjustments. So if you're needing to do just a lift, you can use what's called the, the, four, the 13A, the short form. But if it has any type of acquisition, easements, uh, then you need to go to long form. And, and so for ATP state, so if it's ATP state only funded, then Caltrans is not really involved. At least local assistance is not directly involved in the right of way um, certification. And so the city will submit and the city just needs to in their allocation request needs to note that they've certified it in its self certification in the allocation request. And then for bridge projects, an agency hire bring on construction management team before the construction funds is approved. Currently, PE. Ah, you're getting into a, a, a the the issue of a, a construction management firm. Um, you know, if it's if you have. You want me to answer that? I can answer yeah, that. Yeah, Alicia, please do, because you've got, con <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, so if it's a consultant, you're using the consultant contract, right? It's not construction. So construction, you have to wait until you get your authorization. Consultant, you can absolutely 
procure the contract. But remember, you can't do any reimbursable work until you get that authorization. So I think that was the question. Can you yeah. hire them? You can, but don't start any reimbursable work until you get your authorization uh, for consultants. Yeah. And, that, and so, so the key behind that is that you can have that consultant on board and they can invoice the initial work against the PE. But once they start getting the construction management and the construction authorization, then they, they would be that same consultant would be then invoicing against the construction engineering phase. Uh, we got just a couple answer one or two more questions. And Peter, as you look at the last questions that you'll field here, uh, Dawn had her hand raised. So let's go ahead and uh, yeah, give her a, a moment to clarify her question. Okay, go ahead. Um, thanks. Yeah, so regarding the, the contracting uh, and the contract uh, management um, work, um, I, I just have a, a general question about uh, pre-award audit requirements. On those consultants, if you're doing something that's uh, project specific versus like a task order with our on call, um, what is the typical time frame to expect for those pre award audits to be completed so we can execute those contracts? We what? actually don't do pre award audits um, anymore for those. Not on project specific? Do you still do it for on calls? No, we have the 10C process. Um, I don't know if anyone's here from the consultant group, but yeah, so we have the 10C process and that's basically um, it. We used to do pre-award audits. Yeah, back before like 2018, but then those went away with our risk-based 10C. Okay, so is there some lengthier process? I know like for us, we have uh, CM contracts that have been held up for like six months already. Mm. So are they through Cal with Caltrans? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So Caltrans has a different process. So if you're going through DPAC, would be different than if you're if you have a local let. No, project. there are contracts. They're Sandag contracts. They've gone through a process of of review. Maybe it's more related. I, I just know our contracts team came over to see me and said that they've got CM contracts that are held up in Caltrans audits that they can't. Uh, finalize the contracts and they've been held up for like six months. Maybe it's an ICAP thing. Yep. As I say, it, it's probably an ICR uh, review, uh, indirect cost rate review or DBE or something like that. Um, yeah, I know it's not DBE, so it must be indirect cost rate. So what is typical for that if, if somebody's getting caught up or consultant caught up in that? Because that seems awfully long. Yeah, that does. Um, I, I would reach out to our group and say, right. hey, can you follow up um, to see like because um, that's a risk-based process as well. So there might be something else going on. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I think we've run out of time, Neil. So um... so thank you, Peter. Um, you know, we, we see the importance of the transcripts, right? How many questions do we have and how many little nuggets are in there? Um, please um, see the chat for the link to where you're going to be able to find uh, supplemental attachments such as the Dirty Dozen, which we're going to upload for you, the Dirty Dozen list, um, as well as a full list of answers to all of the questions asked here today. We're going to take a quick 10-minute uh, break. Share if you wouldn't mind putting on the timer. Let's go refresh your cup of coffee, get a new cup of tea or uh, ice water, what have you, and uh, we'll see you back here in a couple minutes. Okay, we changed the function in the Q&A box. Um, behind the scenes, we had a little discussion that maybe folks could only see their question and it might be beneficial for everybody to see everybody else's question. Um, so we have since changed that function. And as I mentioned, so many questions, so many great uh, tricks of the trade. Folks like Peter have been learning all of these you know, secret tips um, over a lifetime in his career with local assistance. And it might be a great opportunity for us to polish them and, and provide you with a, a consolidated 
um, tips and tricks um, for success, as it were. Um, so again, please stay tuned for uh, more comprehensive answers to all of your questions. And in the meantime, let's go ahead and continue our program. We have a great presentation coming up for you next um, from the newest member of the divisions management team, Gretchen. I'm here. <laughs> Are you ready for me? I'm ready. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Um, yes, I don't have a, a working webcam right now, so you only get to hear me today. Okay, we'll just let our imaginations um, <laughs> go go wild here. And um, you can screen share and share your presentation. That, that's the important part. Yep, perfect. All right, let's do this. Thanks, Gretchen. All right, super. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Gretchen Chavez. I'm the office chief for the Clean California Local Grant Program in the Division of Local Assistance. And while I know you're having training day today, this presentation isn't exactly training, but this has been top of mind for many communities um, to learn about the grant process and then uh, who receive grants. So I wanted to take the opportunity to just bring you folks up to speed and then answer any questions you might have about the program. So I'll just move on here. Um, just a refresh, oops. Hmm, I'm not advancing, sorry, give me one second. There we go. So a quick refresh about the program. The Clean California program as a whole consists of two points, the beautification program, uh, public education, and the project design side that Caltrans is implementing. And then the local grant program, which is a competitive grant program just for local agencies. And that uh, program was a set aside of $296 million out of that $1 billion pot. So our program had four legislative goals, uh, reducing the amount of wasted debris in public spaces, beautifying and improving public spaces. We wanted to see if we can re rehabilitate and bring some unused public space back into use for local communities. And we wanted to look about enhancing uh, public health you know, for walking and recreation. So there are parks and trails and, and things that get people out and again, connecting back to their communities and also advancing equity for underserved communities. Legislation required that no less than 50% of the funds in this program have a benefit for an underserved community. So that played a large role in the competitive grant program. So here's a map of the where the awarded projects landed throughout the state. Uh, we had a total of, again, $296 million available we received 326 applications that included more than $758 million in grant requests. So we were in the end able to award 105 projects and we awarded all but about $51,000 of the funding that was available. We um, made sure that we made every dollar that we could was awarded to a local agency. So the selection of the projects was based on quality of the project relative to those program goals that we talked about. Um, projects that were um, that only had partial eligibility, perhaps they did not meet all four goals, but maybe one of the goals might not have been as competitive. Projects where a portion of the scope of work was applicable to the program, but other portions were not such as road widening projects that included perhaps at one beautification piece, those were less competitive. Uh, we also looked at deliverability, ensuring that these projects can be delivered and completed by June 30th, 2024. That is a, a hard deadline and a requirement of the program. And we looked at any other outstanding issues that might affect the deliverability, such as encroachment permits, or if, there's, uh, if the project touches the state highway system in some way. We also looked for projects that were going to live beyond that June 30th, 2024 deadline. So we asked applicants to tell us the life, the anticipated life of the project improvement, and then how they would fund that project improvement, how would they maintain it to ensure that it lived again beyond the June 30th, 2024. And so if there were projects that had little or no maintenance plan, again, those would have been less competitive. Another cornerstone ultimately in, in um, selecting 
the projects in the end was the usability by the community. Um, simply beautifying a public space is well, it's very nice if it didn't actually um, encourage the community to come out, if it didn't result in the community having an active um, perhaps park or a, a another place where uh, communities can be active and be out and about with the community, it was less community, uh, excuse me, less competitive. And again, that benefit to underserved communities was really a cornerstone and projects that had less than a 50% benefit to an underserved community were uh, less competitive. And again, this program was oversubscribed completely at $758 million in requests and only $296 million to grant. This, meant this was a hugely competitive process. So I wanted to show you the dark purple, I guess those are purple or dark circles are overlaid now with the green diamonds. And those green diamonds show you where the kelp trans beautification projects are being implemented. So statewide, you see there's quite a spread and pretty much every region and every area in the state is being touched with either the local grant program or the beautification program. Uh, so you can see the spread across the state. This was for the local grant program pretty organic. We did not prescribe certain amounts of funding per district, but you can see that the project selection did occur throughout the state and many rural areas as well as urban areas. And in a few projects, I just wanted to highlight and tell you a little bit about these were some of the uh, a few projects that did receive um, funding. The Hoopa 4 project, the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation project received $5 million in grant funding. And this project had four components to it, uh, park, radio grounds, campgrounds, and their neighborhood facilities. And you can tell by the, the pictures here, the, the grounds have been well maintained, but these, pro, these grounds were built during the bicentennial. So uh, while the community has done a really nice job trying to keep things clean. You can tell that they have not been able to restore or do upgrades and um, build out these areas like you would uh, see in some more affluent communities. Um, this became a really nice project. Each of these locations in, in the tribal community is considered something akin to a veterans memorial. So these areas have a really important role in the local community. So these four areas were selected and built upon the will of the Hoopa community. Um, they're identified uh, during public processes, such as the design fair that they've had, uh, master planning in the area. So these projects were really well thought out by the community and they're very meaningful to the community. The next project that we wanted to highlight is the City of Sacramento's Floor and Road Community Beautification Program. This part of Sacramento has, has definitely had its ups and downs. I, I'm from Sacramento, so I, I, I do know where, where this project location is occurring. Uh, and the community's really been trying to rebound and um, trying to bring the community back to health, so to speak. Um, this is a 1.5 mile stretch. It will include three murals, uh, banner poles, big belly trash cans, bus stop shelter ads, uh, public art installations, um, landscaping all over. What's really interesting and stood out about this project is how they're bringing in the local high school into uh, beautification and litter abatement. And what they're, what they're doing is creating an internship with the uh, local Luther Burbank High School. And they're having the students get involved in identifying areas for uh, litter abatement and where they want to um, make additional focus for the program. So one of the goals of, of Clean California was to make some kind of fundamental change to the communities that we change how we think about uh, litter and abatement and beautification. And doing this through young people in the community and having them become an active part of addressing the situation and, um, and being a part of the solution is how we start making those changes. So this was really a cool project in that way, among others. 
So this park, uh, this is Sheridan Park in Orange Cove, California, the city of Orange Cove. Uh, a little over 200, excuse me, a little over $2.5 million in grant funding. Uh, this community, this is the only park uh, on their side of town. And it's been uh, run down and rather dilapidated for a long time. I don't know if you can see very well the top right hand corner of the picture. Those are actually their park swings. And they don't have any swings. Those are just the poles that are left. Um, the condition of the park has deteriorated so much that they no longer hold little league uh, games here. The community is unable to use the park for much of anything. So this um, project is going to completely renovate and restore this park for the surrounding community. Uh, a big deal um, that the community then has a place to go. There's an event stage, again, uh, a baseball diamond for the kids, soccer and playground. So we're pretty excited to see this project moving forward. And then in the city of Los Angeles, the Housing Authority is rebuilding and redeveloping an area called Jordan Downs. It's a public-private partnership. It's going to transform 70 to 80 acres uh, in the current um, public housing in Watts, Los Angeles, Watts, excuse me, Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. And they're going to completely renovate and bring in mixed-use housing, uh, mixed-use business, um, renovated housing, and this community, what was interesting about it is it's sort of landlocked. The exterior roads come to this huge um, development and then stop. The bus service doesn't get inside the community and the people who live here are in essence very landlocked from the surrounding communities. So the whole redevelopment of this area is going to open up lots and bring in the surrounding community and, and enable lots to be a part of the surrounding larger communities and bring in the mass transit and so forth. So right now they don't have parks and public spaces per se. So this redevelopment, what this grant's focusing on is providing that public space and enhancement and creating parks and areas for kids to play and people to hang out and, and have a neighborhood they can be proud of. So this is a really exciting project in Southern California. And the total uh, grant amount for this was $5 million. So this project is in Santa Cruz County, the Green Valley Road Multi-Use Trail. Another really interesting project, and it, uh, it's a little surprise we had, perhaps this project had it come forth in other programs because it is a, a real needed, a highly needed advancement for the community. If you see the bottom right hand uh, portion of the screen, there's a person walking on a dirt path. That is in fact the only path between this community and Watsonville, where most folks work. This is the Green Valley Multi-Use Trail, and it's nothing more than dirt and some broken concrete. This is, in this community, 63% of the people walk or bike, and this is the trail that they use. It's alongside of a very busy road. This is the one um, direct connection between Watsonville and the rural parts of the county, so it's very heavily trafficked. And there's really no safe way for people to walk and bike while staying off um, the Green Valley Road. So this project for $5 million investment is going to create a nice wide paved um, biking and walking lane that's separated from that road. It's also going to create, it's a, it's a bit blurry, but in the top right corner is a picture of the bus stops, which is a sign. And this community, there is no shelter, whether it's in the heat or in the cold, there's no shelter at all for any of their mass transit. So this project will provide some bus stop shelters as well as that greatly needed walking and biking path. So again, another really well-deserved uh, project that we're super excited for. So what's coming up next? Well, we're working on executing grant agreements. Those uh, 105 projects that received awards cannot begin until we get all of the grant agreements executed. So we're reaching out. We've been reaching out to the local agencies on what they need to do next and going through the process of executing those awards. We have district grant managers who are being introduced to those local agencies will help walk them through the processes. We're working on debriefings for any applicants, and it'll be next month before we're able to set up um, appointments for folks who are interested in debriefing. And then in the event we have additional funding for this program, we're also making sure that we're focusing on developing lessons learned out of cycle one. So like I said, if we do have any available funds that come up um, in another cycle, maybe two years from now, 
then we wouldn't be able to embrace that quickly and make whatever necessary updates and improvements we can to the program. That's kind of where we are now. I'm going to stop sharing and ask for questions. And I think there's, it looks like there's probably a lot in the Q&A, but we can try to go through and answer um, some of these questions. Currently, um, the 17 that are there are from the previous presentation. I oh. don't see any current questions coming up. If folks want to enter any questions in the Q&A box, now would be a good time for Gretchen to see them. And while th folks are thinking about that, um, do you have any Gretchen um, lessons learned that are kind of like uh, um, at the the at the tip of your fingers, as it were? Anything that that kind of like really sticks out to you in terms of lessons learned from the past uh, application cycle, or even delivering these projects um, that you could share? Well. <laughs> I guess it's a lesson learned, but I don't know if it's something we can overcome for the next cycle. But one of the biggest obstacles to everyone was the timing. This has been a super fast program. And the legislation, the way it was written, mandated that we had certain uh, deadlines we had to meet for, had to call for projects, and then when we had to award. So this, this created a lot of, um, for everyone, not just stress, but really having to redirect staff from whether it's the local agency or Caltrans, they're going to try to meet all of these, these deadlines. And I think we would all like to have more time next time around to put more thought into the processes, have time to write the applications, have even more time to review applications. Uh, if we can, we'd like to make that happen. Um, but again, the way the legislation was written, we were really stuck with the, the time frames that, that we had, and we'll try to see if we can make that uh, uh, work if, again, if we get extra money. Sure. Well, while, while folks are thinking about any questions they might have for you, and we got a couple more uh, minutes in your time slot, um, you know, let me, let me bounce something off you, Gretchen, and see if this is, is, if this is fair, see if we have any, any advice, as it were, for our audience. Um, now, our local agency partners are member agencies of their um, regional transportation planning organizations, right? And many of the RTPAs and MPOs um, have assistance programs, uh, their own local assistance programs um, that, that utilize on-call consultant contracts of various kinds to help really take the planning process into the grant application prep arena. Um, conceptual design exhibits, architectural renderings, cost estimates, and this kind of thing. Um, and this is a way that the RTPAs and MPOs can help their local agency members um, really hone in on their priorities for delivery, um, identify some of their own local agency institutional obstacles, as it were, and then to develop really strong project scopes so that they're prepared to move into that grant application and that, that project delivery process. Now, all of this is pre-federal aid, um, pre-state funding, um, pre-reimbursable work. Um, it's really just like that, that, that extra mile of the planning process, I, I might characterize it as. Um, if, if you have any local agencies in the audience today, we got 312 people still, or agencies, folks um, still out there today. Um, is there any advice that you might have for them, given that relationship between the RTPAs and MPOs and their local agency members and the services that the RTPAs and MPOs can provide the locals? Is there any advice that you might have um, for those two partners in that relationship to help them prepare for the next cycle? Sure, I appreciate that question. Um, so I could offer this. I think what was interesting about the applicants who participated was we had really a lot of small rural communities that participated. Um, and a lot of folks who aren't necessarily used to working with Caltrans or, or creating grant applications. And the idea that they were interested and they wanted to participate was huge. But I think it would be helpful perhaps if there's an opportunity for uh, the RTPAs or the MPOs to perhaps reach out to some of those communities to offer them some assistance on how you uh, put together a grant application, particularly um, the budget side of that and, and what that looks like. I think a lot of communities struggle with the understanding what uh, 
what an infrastructure project is versus non-infrastructure and how you, and the differences in how you put together a cost proposal for those two. And it's not, it's not necessarily the easiest nuances if those aren't things you're used to doing. So I think that um, if there's an ability for the regional agencies to help out with the smaller communities, that would be great. I think our typical larger agencies are well versed in what those things mean and how to do that. So I think it's really the, those smaller uh, agencies who are oftentimes uh, underserved uh, that can use that, that assistance. And I think those are some of the things we think through as well for the next time around where we did a lot, we made a lot of tutorials, a lot of online um, uh, activities and, and tools for people to use for the applications. But even with all of that, um, we still saw that there are areas where additional tutorials could be created. And I think that, uh, again, it, whatever we can do to help these smaller communities, even, even through your organizations, would be super helpful. And I see we have uh, one question in the chat. I would like our instructors to think um, if they have any advice on that whole issue of um, preparing for funding, um, making sure your organizational ducks are in a row, so to speak, so that you can uh, mitigate any potential risks to project delivery after you get funding, right? So greasing the skids um, uh, before acquiring funding. So, so think about that, gang. And, and RTPAs and MPOs out there, um, if you have any best practices that you'd like to share right here, right now in real time, um, and how your local agency members can utilize those services, feel free to chime in. Um, Gretchen, the question in the Q&A is, after Clean California grant agreement execution, will cities need to submit requests for authorizations to Caltrans or CTC funding allocations to authorize the funding? So no, the, the answer is no, not at all. So these funds do not flow through the CTC. So we will execute the restricted grant agreements and then issue an, a notice to proceed and agencies are off and running. At that point, they will, uh, after that, and they start their work, they will invoice us in arrears, no less than quarterly, and they'll receive reimbursement for, but for the portions of the funds that, that come from the Clean California program. Um, one of the things, um, that we talked about how we can help some of the local communities. It's not just that whole the idea about infrastructure, non-infrastructure. How do we how do we build cost proposals? But some of the other nuances um, that maybe the smaller agencies don't know about, and that's how to have an indirect cost rate approved. And going through that uh, the the uh, inspector general, sorry, the IAOC <laughs> office with Caltrans, and, and that process is quite lengthy. That takes a long time. And while we also let folks know that they had to go through that process if they wanted to request reimbursement for indirect cost rates, I don't think that some agencies really understood what that meant. And again, these are typically smaller agencies that haven't done business with Caltrans in the recent past. And those things are kind of would, would be new to them. Um, what I, I will also give this little shout out for the program. These are projects that, that came about through the local grant program, parks and trails and, and artwork. These are some pretty non-traditional transportation projects. And what's really cool about this program is that these are funds that are going so directly to the communities for community benefit. So this is, there's such a really neat component of the program that we get to see a fairly immediate benefit to local communities. It's not a large construction project and it, you know, we're in design and then we're gonna construct it about five or six years and then it'll roll out. This is, these projects will be done within the next two years and the communities will be able to enjoy the fruition of, of those projects. Um, what I would say is that, in my plug, is that these non-traditional projects that we see here well, they aren't all gonna be a fit with our other transportation funding areas. I think that this hopefully will push all of us to think a little bit differently, maybe about how we view priorities in, in our agent, in our local areas and our regions, and try to think a little more broadly about what the needs are in our communities. And can we push the envelope a little bit and how we consider transportation and, and what is in the best benefit of those local communities. So, just food for thought uh, as we move forward. We don't, 
I, I will clarify, we have no idea if we're getting additional funds for this for this program. The governor did publicly announce that he would like to see an additional $100 million, but that would be fiscal year 23-24. So we have a ways to go till we find out if that actually happens. But in the meantime, we are so excited about the 105 projects that were selected, and we're really looking forward to what that looks like for the communities in your regions and excited that when these come to again fruition and people really can enjoy the, the outcomes. <clears throat> There's a, a question in the chat, Gretchen, to circle back on. Um, I, I believe you mentioned um, indirect cost allocation um, rates, uh, approval for that. Um, Jose's question in the chat is, I didn't catch that. What form or paperwork does a recipient need to fill out to start reimbursable work? Uh, it, it, there's a whole process laid out through Caltrans, and it is the, so I'm going to trip myself up on what the, is the I, IAOC, sorry, I'm going to give you the wrong acronym. It is the Independent Office of Audits and Investigations. And on their website, they outline a whole process for having indirect cost rates approved. And it's, it's more than just a form. There is um, under their resources tab, they list, and I can share this if, I, if anybody wants to see this. Under their resources tab, they list the indirect cost rate acceptance and approval. And again, this is the ig.dot.ca.gov. And let's see if I can put this in the chat. There's the website in the chat that will, um, with a link um, for this website. Any other questions that came up today? I don't see any questions. We do have a couple more minutes. If any instructors would like to chime in on any advice um, related to the Clean California program or prepping projects in general, um, or if any of the RTP or MPO representatives on the, on the line uh, today would like to raise their hand and, and provide any advice themselves. We got a, a really helpful observation from Kenny in the Q&A that um, we need to be very conscientious of looking out for conflicts between local and federal procurement provisions um, so that there's no inconsistency that that might bar us from reimbursement of those federal funds, um, as it were. So I guess I'll leave with one one parting thought that that's it's not been a big deal, but for some of our local agencies, just as a reminder, it's really important if any local agency is going through an audit um, that they respond timely to the audit, that they don't let uh, those audits lapse because that can affect future awards. And uh, they can be, it, it, such as the local grant program, we don't have many, but there are a few that have not been very responsive and we don't want people to miss out on funding opportunities. So. If there's a nugget that might be good to share with members about making sure that if they do have audit requests from Caltrans, they make sure that they're on top of that. Single audits and also uh, contractual audits. Very good. Um, before we move on to the next subject, I wanted to say thank you for uh, to Michael in the Q&A for reminding us about the 10A uh, submittal process that's described in chapter 10 of the LAPM. Um, and Dustin has a question, um, Gretchen, before we wrap on this module here, um, or this, this information sharing here. Um, uh, Dustin asks if you can speak to the invoicing for the program. So we are finalizing invoicing processes, but our intention is to follow the normal uh, local assistance guidelines for invoicing. So I'm not, I'm not sure beyond that what that question might be, but that's our intention. And I think we're pretty much there. Okay. 
Um, and thank you for the supplemental detail, um, Kenny. These are exactly the kinds of uh, regulatory conflicts that we try to address with our with our guidance, which is also why it's so important that we have regular communication um, with you guys, um, because things are changing on us all the time. Um, and so we have to have ways to communicate um, all of these changing requirements with you, which interestingly enough is the subject of our next um, topic. Um, Daniel's here to talk um, with Sherry about um, our blog, um, how we provide uh, announcements via our email listserv and the different training opportunities that we have through the Office of Guidance and Oversight. Um, Daniel, take it away. Hi, Neil, uh, it's Sherry. I'm gonna go ahead and present today. Very good. Uh, Daniel is going to go ahead and cover the, um, well, I can get the transition here on my, my PowerPoint to share. Um, sorry about that, folks. Had some tech technical difficulty and hopefully I can overcome it now. I think by now we've all been there, Sherry. We got you yeah, back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> two, <laughs> two years. Um, Daniel's going to cover the, um, uh, excuse me, he's going to cover the the Q&A while I go over the presentation and I cannot get my PowerPoint to just share. Just my luck. There, there you go. There we go. All right, all right. Thank you everyone for your patience. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sherry Graham and I am the Division of Local Assistance Training and Communications Coordinator. And Daniel Burke is the Program Reviews and Outreach Branch Manager and we work together in the Guidance and Oversight Office to provide news and trainings for local and tribal agencies. We will gladly answer any of your questions in the Q&A chat in a few minutes. And I'll also add new news and training links in the chat at the end of this presentation. Um, as Neil shared earlier this afternoon, the Division of Local Assistance partners with state universities to provide low cost and subsidized training for local and tribal agencies via state and federal funding. Um, earlier, he mentioned about LTAP, which is the Local Technical Assistance Program. Trainings and Equipment Loan Program will be managed through DLA's newest training partner, California State University of Long Beach, Center for International Trade and Transportation. Cooperative Training Assistance Program, also known as CTAP, is managed through both UC Berkeley tech transfer trainings and Sacramento State College of Continuing Education. Sac State provides federal aid series trainings, which you may be familiar with, while UC Berkeley Tech Transfer provides more technical trainings for in the field application. CITT will begin providing trainings later this year. And if you'll note, the university's icons are hyperlinked on this PowerPoint presentation. So I will uh, provide a new copy of it to uh, so that it'll get uploaded onto the portal. For the local assistance uh, trainings that are provided throughout the state, the LTAP website is a hub for news trainings, proven countermeasures, equipment loan program, previous training record recordings and resources. Caltrans training and resource website you can view more details about training resources, links to federal and national sites, past training recordings, and more. After this presentation, please feel free to access the links I'll put in the chat and you can see live what uh, available trainings there are through the LTAP Center and also through Sac State and UC Berkeley. So you're wondering, how do I find out about these trainings? Well, each week we send out a weekly email generally on Wednesdays, um, and we will notify you about events like today, our quarterly trainings, uh, daily, weekly trainings that come up, news events. Uh, those email announcements are sent on Wednesday once again as a standalone news and training announcement, while office bulletins are sent on any other day, actually Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, if you'd like to know more about how to sign up for these email announcements that we send out and office bulletins, well, we want you to go to the DLA blog. Yep, that's our hub also for news and training that we send out notices for. If you go to the DLA blog, the Division of Local Assistance provides news, updates, training opportunities, and more. View the upcoming events calendar on the left column. 
uh, if you, that's a hyperlink to a list of all uh, large events, council meetings, things you might be interested for your local or tribal agency. And also on the right side of the column, you'll see how to sign up to receive those DLA emails I just spoke about. Um, this directly takes you to the backside of Constant Contact to sign up for emails that you can also uh, unsubscribe to at any time. But that's how we can know that you're interested in the news and trainings that we provide statewide. And so that is sweet and short and to the point. I'm gonna open it up to any questions. And after this, we'll go ahead and um, also share how you can contact us with any additional questions. Good afternoon, Sherry and attendees. I do not see any questions yet in the Q&A box. Please feel free. This is a judgment-free presentation. I've also uploaded the link directly into the chat box. So if you do wish to sign up for the local assistance blog subscription, it's uh, there at your convenience. Thank you. Great. So I'm also going to add into the chat um, our direct contact email. So after this, if folks have additional questions or comments, they can go ahead and reach us directly. And um, we'll go ahead and either field those to the direct contacts or we will answer them directly. And this hopefully helps us stay on time, short and sweet, informational about news and training. Neil, I'm going to pass it back off to you. We can take a break early and or answer additional questions as needed. Sure. Um, let me just put something else in the chat. So as we mentioned at the outset, the chat is full of very, very important links. Um, before we dis, we have a, a couple more uh, modules left today, but before we disband, please make sure that you peruse the chat and copy and paste those links um, for your future reference. Um, and, and I'm going to put in, we noticed a couple of contact information, um, uh, co contact numbers are, are incorrect in a presentation. I provided the overview um, presentation earlier. And as you, as, as we, we talked about, one of our challenges is uh, this, you know, rotating workforce. So um, making sure that we're using the things like the blog and our, our email distribution list to keep everyone up to date um, with changes is a really, really pretty important part of the process. So I'm going to put a link to that list of district contacts in the chat right now. And not seeing any questions or hands raised, let's go ahead and take our final break um, for the day. Sheriff, if you wouldn't, put, uh, wouldn't mind putting on a timer, we'll go ahead and take a, a brief break and then we'll be back uh, with the Office of State Programs who is going to talk about timely use of funds um, introduce their own staff changes, um, talk about cycle six of the ATP program, the guidelines and the summary of the changes there, as well as reporting requirements that you're going to need to know about. We'll be right back. All right, Office of State Programs. Let's do this. Look, we got a whole group here with us today. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Desiree, I'm asking you to put the PowerPoint up. Thank you. So I'm, uh, my name is Kathy McKeown. I am the office chief for the Office of State Programs and I, with the Division of Local Assistance, I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time today. I know it's beautiful outside, but uh, so it's hard to stay engaged, but I appreciate your hanging in there. I wanted to introduce my staff that we have on today, uh, Desiree Fox. She's been with the ATP program for a couple of years now. She's the program manager for the North, uh, Trina Lu is the ATP program manager for the South uh, Districts. Elijah Hall is our acting CTC liaison. He's new to our staff. He comes um, from the Division of uh, Structures and he was a designer for several years. Um, he's done a stint in uh, transportation programming and has also worked at a 
with the Office of uh, Federal Programs within DLA, so he's no stranger to us. Um, and I wanted to welcome him aboard and also introduce you. He will be your contact for Tufts. But we didn't want to throw him to the wolves right away, so we're going to let Desiree take that uh, presentation for the Tufts today. Mary Hardigan is our reporting program manager for ATP, and, and uh, she will also give a presentation. And um, since we're all busy today, I'll just let you take it from there. Um, next slide. Okay. Hi, my name is Desiree Fox, and I'm actually the ATP manager, as Kathy mentioned, for infrastructure projects for North. And I'm filling in today to do the timely use of funds presentation. So to start, here are the programs within the Office of State Programs, which are administered by the California Transportation Commission and that follow the timely use of funds policy. And those are the State Transportation Improvement Program, or STIP, the Active Transportation Program, or ATP, the SB, and the SB1 programs, which are the Local Partnership Program, or LPP, the Solutions for Congested Corridors Program, or SCCP, and the Trade Corridors Enhancement Program. So just to do an overview of the programs quickly, the STIP is a multi-year capital improvement program of transportation projects with a five-year programming document that's updated every two years. And there is about 1.5 billion currently programmed. And the purpose of the ATP is to encourage increased use of active modes of transportation, such as walking, biking, and rolling. There are now approximately 650 million in funding available for this current cycle, which just launched on March 15th, which is in its cycle six. And Trina will discuss this later in her presentation. And the cycles are every two years. And then the SB1 programs that come from the gas tax revenue all have different program goals. The LPP provides funding to local and regional agencies to improve aging infrastructure. And there is about 200, per, 200 million per year in funding capacity. The SCCP provides funding for the construction phase of projects with the goal to reduce congestion in highly traveled or congested corridors that balance uh, transportation improvements with community impacts and environmental benefits. And there is about 250 million per year in funding capacity. And the TCEP funds corridor-based freight projects with a funding capacity of 300 million per year. The CTC recognizes four project phases, which are the project approval and environmental document phase, also known as PANED, or the environmental phase, the plans, specifications, and estimates phase, also known as the ps &E or design phase, the right-of-way phase, and the construction phase, which you'll likely hear me refer to as CON. ATP projects also have the CON and I phase for non-infrastructure and plan projects. The timely use of funds guidelines were established by statute for STIP to urge agencies to deliver projects in a timely manner, and were later applied to the other programs managed by CTC. There are four types of timely use of funds deadlines to be aware of, and those are allocations, expenditures, contract award, and project completion. And I will discuss them more in detail on the following slides. Um, so allocation timely use of funds. Allocations are simply a funding request. So when you're ready to request your funds based on your project's progress and having the necessary certifications completed, you'll request an, allocate, an allocation within the state fiscal year that the funds are programmed. And you have until the end of the, I'm sorry. And you'll have until the end of the, um, of the program state fiscal year, which is June 30th, before you need to request your funds or the funds will lapse and will no longer be available. 
This rule applies to all four project phases, along with CON and I for non-infrastructure and plan ATP projects. Expenditure time and the use of funds. So once you have allocated your funds for the PA and ED, ps and &E, and right-of-way phases, you have until the end of the second fiscal year following an allocation to expend the funds. For example, if you allocate your funds at any time in fiscal year 21-22, which happens to be the current fiscal year, you have until the end of 23-24 to expend the funds. Contract award time of use of funds applies to the construction phase only. So once you have allocated your construction funds, you have six months before you need to award the project to a contractor. Completion time to use of funds. So after your project has been awarded to a contractor, you have 36 months after the contract award date to, uh, to expend your construction phase funds. Um, you can also request longer than 36 months at the time of construction allocation, but you need a justification. So what happens if you can't meet those predetermined deadlines? Well, you can request a one-time extension of each type for each phase. And you would submit that request when your deadline is approaching. So a few months before your deadline is approaching, you wanna reach out to your district local assistance representative and discuss submitting a time extension request. The amount of additional time that you can request is also limited and it varies by program. So this graphic shows the differences in the amount of additional time that you can request. And this form can be found on the local assistance blog um, as, as, that was discussed in the presentation before. And uh, there's also the website shown there. And so you can see um, the differences um, shown. So for STIP, you can only, you can request up to 20 months of an extension for everything. Um, but for ATP, it's different. You can only request up to 12 months, except for allocations, you can get a 20 month extension. Um, and then the other, the SB1 programs have their own um, deadlines or um, requirements as well with extensions. And this is an example of the allocation slash time extension request form, which is known as Exhibit 25A in the Local Assistance Procedures Guide. And this is the SMART form that was created after the Lean Six Sigma process to help stream, streamline that allocation and time extension process. And we're currently updating the form to be more inclusive of CON and I allocations and extensions. But within the 25A, form, you need to pay special attention to the reason for project delay section. The reason needs to be an unforeseen and an extraordinary circumstance beyond control of the responsible agency. And you must indicate a concise yet detailed reason for the delay. So specify the delay time and include a timeline to justify the additional time requested. You also need to make sure that you have all necessary signatures before submitting your requests for additional time. And as you're discussing this with your dis district local assistance representative, they will reference the CTC meeting preparation schedule to determine which meeting your request will be heard at since your request will require a CTC action and vote by the commissioners. and only the CTC can approve or deny time extension requests. The requests are not automatic. You are encouraged to attend the CTC meetings when your time extension request is on the agenda to hear the status or defend the request if needed. And an extension letter will be sent to you from our office after the extension is approved. And I want to finish by saying that these are all things that should be considered when creating your project schedules prior to applying for your projects, since the ultimate goal is to minimize the amount of time, uh, time extensions that are needed. And if you have any questions, feel free to add them to the Q&A, we'll, or we can answer them at the end of the presentations. But after this meeting, um, these are some folks, these are some emails that you can reach out to. There's the DLAE contact list. Hopefully it matches the one that was already sent before a couple of times. 
and um, the timely use of funds email as well. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Trina. Thank you, Desiree. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Trina from Caltrans Headquarter Local Assistance uh, OSP office. And my topic today is what has been changed in 2023 Active Transportation Program Cycle 6. ATP program was created in 2013 by Senate Bill 99 and Assembly Bill 101. It combined several federal and state programs to make California a national leader in active transportation. Next slide, please. As you may aware of, ATP funding got augmented with SB1 fund from ATP cycle three. And last year, the new bipartisan infrastructure law we call bill or EJ provides more federal funds for active transportation program. For this cycle six, the total, pro uh, the total programming capacity is $650 million. Um, state highway account provides $68 million. SB1 account provides the biggest portion, which is $300 million. And the federal tax funds will provide um, $282 million. Yeah, next slide, please. Here are the important dates for ATP cycle six. At March CDC meeting, the new ATP guidelines and the fund estimate were adopted. And CDC has sent out the call for project last Friday. Yeah, the date uh, right after the March CDC meeting. And now the application form and the related materials are posted on the website, please check out. The application is due on June 15th this year and the statewide selection as well as small urban and the rural selection will be adopted at CTC December meeting this year. And cycle six will continue the quick build pilot phase two and the selection will be adopted at CTC meeting, a uh, December CTC meeting as well. And as for the MPO selected projects, the adoption will be at June CTC meeting next year. Next slide, please. ATP guidelines went through several changes and gained improvements each cycle. In this cycle six, some improvements and the changes were made and I categorized the change into two types. For uh, one type is the revisions to previous guidelines. For this type, some of the revisions are building the application form already, you know, cycle six application form already, yeah. In cycle six, the application is paperless, all digital submittal, and please aware that thresholds, thresholds for project size were changed. So do not use the wrong form. If the project overall cost is less than three, three and a half million dollars, it is a small project application. Median size application is from $3.5 million up to 10 million. And the large size application is about $10 million. For large, for a large project application based on the guidelines section 20D. If the proposed project is in current adopted plans, it will get more points. When you fill out the application form, you will be asked whether or not your, uh, your proposed project is included in the current adopted plans. If the proposed project is on state highway system, the applicants needs to include a form called State Highway System Project Impact Assessment Form in the application. We all know California Street is very busy. Some street sections have the annual average daily traffic, we call AADT, greater than 125,000. Based on the guidelines, section 17, if the proposed project is within 500 feet radius of this section, an explanation on why choose this location and the effort to minimize the exposure to air pollution is needed. But don't worry, this will not be scored. In cycle six, $7 million was reserved for a quick build pilot phase two, and the funds will be programmed in three fiscal years from fiscal year 22-23 to fiscal year 24-25. And the funds delivered 
uh, and the funds um, are for construction phase only and the project needs to deliver it accordingly. If a quick build project uses design build method to deliver the project, the design cost can be included in the construction phase. Quick build projects have more flexibility than regular ATP projects because during the delivery process, community's feedback and the comments need to be reflected in the delivered products. So the implementing agency will need to engage the communities, most likely adjust the design and the construction per the community's comments. If a quick build project changes the scope dramatically, please follow the regular scope change request and discuss the change with Caltrans and with us. If there is something out of the agency's control, you know, implement the, uh, implement, implementing agency control, so as to delay the projects, the agency can request time extension for a quick build project, but the extension is limited to three months, not like regular projects, you know, you're gonna have 12. Don't forget, Quick Bill has its own application form and please check our website for more, uh, for more details. Some of the revisions to previous guidelines are not reflected in the cycle six application form, but those revisions will impact the project delivery. One of the revisions is scope change. From now on, no scope change will be considered after construction phase allocation, unless adding scope to utilize the cost of savings from contract bidding. If the project benefited a disadvantaged community or communities, in the scope change request, the implementing agency needs to discuss the impact to the disadvantaged communities. Another change is contract award date. Since before, different agencies have different rules. Some use the board approval date as the contract award date. Some use the contract execution date and some use the notice of intention date. So in this cycle, contract award was further defined as executed construction contract. Um, we finished the first type. Now we get to the second type, the added sections. The first added section is section 20AC, project segmenting. We all have projects with many issues out of our control, such as railroad issues, tribal lands issues, and utility relocation issues. Sometimes if we can separate the problematic section from the project, we not only can gain more time to get the issue solved for the problematic sections, but also can deliver the remaining sections quicker. So the purpose of the segmenting is to assist the implementing agency to delivering, uh, on delivering the project. A segmenting request needs to be approved before construction phase. Segmenting needs to be approved before construction phase allocation. And the allocated phase cannot be segmented. Please remember, segmenting will not change the programming year and the one project only can get one segmenting in the project lifetime. If there is a need to segment your project, contact your district to initiate the discussion. Another added section is section 37, project cancellation. If an implementing agency elects to cancel a project, they must stop invoicing and the remaining funds will be returned to the ATP pool. Because a project closeout without construction is not a normal case. A project ends at pre-con phase, you know, we typically call pre-con phase as PAD phase, just like Desri said, PAD phase, PSNE, or right away phases. My need to repay back the funds depends on the cancellation reason. And contact your district if there is a need to cancel a project. Next slide, please. If you have any question regarding ATP cycle six, please feel free to drop your question in the Q&A. Or if you, if you have any question even after this you know, work workshop, please contact your DLAE and if needed, here is the contact information from headquarters. Yeah, with this, I will wrap up and hand it over to Mary. Thank you, Trina. 
Okay, um, I'm Mary Hart again. I manage the branch that takes care of ATP reporting, whether it is um, the agency reporting project specific information to us, and then we also report program status as a whole to the commission. So I'm gonna just give a brief overview of their requirements um, and then what we do in our office. Next slide, please. After Senate Bill 1 was signed, the commission adopted the accountability and transparency guidelines, which set forth some requirements for um, agencies to report on their projects upon adoption into the program, regardless of when the project is programmed to begin. Uh, once they are adopted into the program, they must start reporting. Um, and it starts with progress reporting. This is quarterly. Um, this includes reporting on scope, budget, schedule, and benefits. And this is um, required quarterly in order for us here at Caltrans to identify and mitigate any risks to the project um, so that it can be implemented as it was approved. Uh, and then after progress reporting, once the project is complete, within six months of construction um, or consultant contract acceptance, the project becomes operable or all non-infrastructure activities are complete, the completion report is due. And then after that, uh, the final delivery report is due. And this is not to be confused with the final report of expenditures that um, is submitted to the district. The final delivery report is separate um, and that is submitted to us at headquarters uh, via CalSmart. This report is due within six months of completion of all project activities. And this includes um, after the agency has received their final reimbursement um, and they have conducted their after user counts. And it is, I cannot stress enough how important it is to, um, and it is required that an agency uses the interim count guidance that, um, that can be found on multiple of our um, ATP websites. I know it's on the technical and general information and then also the reporting website, which I will share later. Um, but it is so important for agencies to use that because if we don't have good count data to share with the commission, um, it doesn't, you know, we want to show success of the program. So it's just so important and it is required that um, this count guidance is used for the before counts and the after counts. So please don't forget that uh, before you implement your project and then when you're submitting your final delivery report. In addition to the final delivery report that is due in CalSmart, there are also some supplemental documents that you can find on our reporting web page that, like I said, will be shared later. Um, we have a form that Agencies are required to report on their core usage, um, the after user counts before and after, because th those are items that are not included in CalSmart. And then also there is a non-infrastructure detail sheet and a plan detail sheet, just so we can get um, a bunch of the little details from these projects, because a lot of them are so different. We want to showcase them and we, uh, the ATRC, the Active Transportation Resource Center, um, they do such a great job of showcasing these projects. Um, they have some project profiles on the ATP reporting webpage. So if you would like to see some success stories, you can find those there. Um, so those supplemental documents are really, really key in order for us to create those profiles and showcase the program and show what a great job it's doing. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, the reporting is done in CalSmart. Uh, as of January, 2021, the completion and the final delivery reporting is also done in CalSmart. Um, it was not before that. Um, and then just recently, I believe um, earlier this year, um, the CalSmart team made it so that agencies can submit their completion and their final delivery reports at any time. It does not have to be during an open reporting period. For example, um, CalSmart opened January 1st and closed on January 15th for progress reporting. Um, and previously, you could only submit your completion and final during that period. However, they've changed it so you can submit those, uh, the completion and final reports at any time. Um, and I do um, want to just say I, there is some confusion sometimes because you know you submit your completion report, but you can't submit your final report until all of the activities, including invoicing and the after counts are done. Um, and that could take up, um, you know, sometimes up to a year after you submit your completion report because you have to do your counts the same time of the year consistent with your before counts. 
those agencies will still continue to receive reminders from CalSmart about reporting after you submitted your completion, but that does not necessarily mean that you, you will be non-compliant if your FDR is not due yet. So if you ever have any questions regarding that, please feel free to contact myself or um, one of the email addresses that will be provided in a later slide. Um, Cause that can be a little bit confusing and people, agencies will be scared. They don't wanna be not compliant and I completely understand that. So if you have any questions, please feel free to um, shoot us an email, give us a call and we can explain it in more detail. Um, okay, anybody in an agency with an account linked to that agency, if that agency has an active ATP project, they will receive those reporting reminders. So it's super important if there is turnover, say some only the project manager for that agency is the only one with an account. If they retire or leave and nobody else has an account, they are not going to receive those reminders. So somebody at all times, if you have an active project, somebody at the agency must have an account. We do try and do our due diligence to reach out to um, agencies when they're not reporting just to see if they are getting the reminders. But it is important if on, on the agency's end, if you just make sure that somebody has um, an account, it's okay if multiple people have accounts, one person can report on that project and, and that's fine. But it's important for somebody at the agency to get these reminders so that um, you report on time and nobody is um, considered non-compliant. So Caltrans typically opens, you know, the first of the month when that reporting period opens, January, April, July, um, and October. So, and then they have 15 days to report. After those 15 days, then Caltrans has 15 days to review those reports, send it back for a correction or approve it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tight frame, so it's important to start early. Don't wait until the 15th day to um, submit your, to complete your report or submit your report because you may have questions. And we typically get bombarded with tons and tons of questions. And we do, we really try to answer as many as we can. And you may be familiar with Dancy Yang of my staff, who is amazing. She is also responding um, to all of these questions too, but I would just suggest that agencies not wait until the last minute. Um, just a suggestion. Uh, next slide, please. This is the 21-22 schedule. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, on April 1st, it's going to open up for quarter three reporting and it will close on April 15th. Um, this is not a quarter where we will be uh, reporting to the commission. Our latest report we just uh, submitted and the SB1 office reported it to the commission at the March meeting. The next time we will be reporting to the commission on the program as a whole uh, will be in October. And that will cover um, information that was submitted in CalSmart for quarters three and four. Next slide, please. So this is another part of the um, accountability and transparency guidelines that is very, very important. Um, these are consequences that are set in place. Um, these include, but are not limited to, um, and this is consequences for not reporting in CalSmart. Um, and you only have the 15 days to do it. You can't come in after the 15th day and say, I'd like to report. It really has to be within those 15 days. Um, so if an agency is not reporting, um, we send them an email, written warning. Um, they may be required to appear before the commission. We do place them on a watch list, which, which is an attachment to the program report that um, I just mentioned that we um, reported to the commission just this month. Um, we place them on a watch list and we work with the commission and the agency to um, fix the problem. And they stay on the watch list until um, there's a solution. In, until it's resolved. Um, and in most egregious situations, um, they, the agency could be deemed in, ineligible for allocation or any other programming actions and reduced in reimbursements. And this is something that um, Caltrans, the department will work with the commission on which consequence is the most appropriate for, um, for the situation. Next slide, please. So this is the, um, we'll open it up for questions, but first I wanted to 
point out the website that I mentioned a few times. There are lots of important items on that website. Like I said, the interim count guidance. We also have a PowerPoint presentation that's kind of a tutorial of um, navigating through the CalSmart tool. Uh, we also have a recorded webinar where we went through uh, the tool and answered questions. And then lastly, we took uh, Q and A, and that, so that's also posted on the website. And it has a lot of helpful information on the website. So I strongly encourage anyone to visit that if you uh, have a project to report on. And then on the bottom, there's the ATP progress reporting inbox um, where you can submit your questions. And I like uh, it, questions to go to that because there are multiple people that man that inbox. And so if somebody is out of the office, somebody else can see it and get it in time because like I said, it's a short time frame for reporting. So it's important that, um, you send questions to that inbox to make sure that you get an answer in a timely manner. And then um, for any completion or final reporting questions, you can send it to ATP final reporting uh, at dot.ca.gov. Thank you. That's all I have. So we do have a few questions in the inbox. Um, uh, one of the questions is projects that include design and environmental phases through construction take many years to complete in my community. Due to the need for robust outreach, can longer project deadlines be incorporated moving forward for all funding programs? Two years is not long enough for us to work with our stakeholders. Outreach takes one year at least and complete the rest of the project. This assumes no staff turnover occurs that causes delays. Um, so Trina, would you mind answering this uh, question or Desiree? Yeah, either way, uh, for this, maybe, yeah, uh, I would uh, answer this one. And the Desri can, you know, um, if I miss something, Desri can add, add on something. Yeah. And for this one, because um, if the project needs long time, for example, long lease, you know, events or long lease items, typically they can apply for one cycle and uh, they, you know, for the pre-con and the, the, they can, a request or apply for the come phase in the other cycle. So you can actually, you do have to um, uh, apply for the project in just in one cycle first. And the second one is in one cycle, actually, if you can have your PAED in the programming year, the first year, and you can have your come phase in the fourth year, just start it. So actually with that one, you have seven years to implement because the first year, you get your PAD phase started, and the fourth year you get your count phase started. And when your construction phase started, you have three years to complete the construction. So total will have seven years. So I think that typically pretty much enough for a project development cycle. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the only thing that I would add to what Trina was saying, I, I don't know, Trina, if you mentioned that if they wanted to apply um, in the two different fiscal, I mean, the two different cycles with their project, that their project has to be considered a large project. So it would have to be over $10 million. Um, I think the other things to consider are that there are time extensions available. And if you need more time than 36 months in construction, you can request that at uh, construction allocation, as mentioned in the um, presentation. Yeah, I would say that, you know, keep in mind that the extensions that we grant are for extenuating circumstances. So things that were mentioned like turnover of staff, that's not going to cut it. Uh, you know, we have, there's a lot of impacts to our funding. There's a, you know, obligation authority that we have. So there's only so much time that we have to use those funds. And if we don't, then we lose them. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind when you're, um, you know, considering these, these options. That's a really uh, good point, uh, Kathy, that, that we as a department don't always have um, the flexibility um, to make changes in regards to how some of these programs are intended to operate um, because it's stipulated through legislation that, that provides these funds. But I also wanted as the old transportation planner in me to give a plug for the planning process. Um, you know, your projects ideally should come from your local planning process, whether that's your general plan circulation element, your regional transportation plan, or a, a corridor study. So working with stakeholders, scoping your project, and vetting community concern 
is best done before you go out and get money for your project. Now, I understand that we can't always do that perfectly before we get federal funds. And sometimes those federal funds help support those activities. But the more you can do that kind of community engagement, project scoping, and basically planning or preparation for delivery before you go get funding for your project, the better position you'll be in. Yeah, and there in the NI, uh, there is a portion of the NI that covers plans. So just keep that in mind. Um, you can apply for that. Um, so we have another question. Can you confirm timeline for submitting invoices for construction phase in relation to authorization E76 and or construction award? If you need to read it, uh, Trina and or Desiree, it's at 3.50 p.m. <laughs> Uh, so I'll take a crack at this. I, I don't think there's any difference between any of the invoicing except for you have six months after your deadline before you can before you need to complete your invoicing. Yes, you know, I would like to add on a little bit. If you need the federal E76, that means the federalized project. So to be off the inactive list, you need to send in your invoice within certain time frame because after nine months you get e also you know e76 it will be deemed you you know could be put on the inactive list so send in your invoice after you get the e76 because allocation uh, you know once you get a CTC allocation you need to issue the contract award to the contractor within six months if you see you need more time, you know, coming for the, uh, you know, time extension, if you really award the contractor and the hurry up to send in the invoice within the next couple of months, because once you get the E76, you have nine months to send in. Typically, we six months, I think our implementation office, they will send something to you guys to remind you. Okay, we have another question. This one is a combined question by Michael Carley with Coastland Civil uh, Engineering. For an ATP project with CON and NI, is the completion report due after completion of construction? Final delivery report isn't required until NI is done, question mark. Now, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. I think those were two combined questions. Yeah, yeah, and I understand this question. So, um, and I'll give, an answer. Okay, so basically for a standalone construction project, the completion report is due after um, contract, construction contract acceptance or the project becomes op operable, whichever is sooner. For a combination project, the completion report is due, um, it depends. Some projects do NI first, construction after, some do construction first, non-infrastructure after. So whichever comes last, um, the completion report is due after that. Um, so if non-infrastructure is the second portion of the project, you don't submit, you'll continue to submit progress reports until the construction and non-infrastructure is done and then submit your completion report. The final delivery report is due uh, within six months of all activities for either standalone construction, standalone non-infrastructure or combination projects. And that's after final invoices have been paid and the um, after counts are complete uh, because all those projects require the after counts. Um, I hope that answers. So Mary, you. can you clarify, um, is there an exception to, to um, identifying or defining when a project is complete if they've opened it up to traffic? I thought there, there was some um, definition that if it was opened up to traffic, it would be considered a complete project. I, I can't remember. Well, if they have non-infrastructure activities after that, then they don't submit the completion until after all of the non-infrastructure activities are complete as well. Okay. Because if they submit their completion report for the construction portion, then CalSmart won't allow them to submit um, progress reports for the non-infrastructure portion. So all of it has to be complete before you submit the completion. Okay, thank you. Trina, I think we have one extra question for you. This is from Susan Tello. Trina mentioned that the ATP guidelines were updated to clarify that the executed date of the construction contract is the award date. Is this correct? Which section of the ATP guidelines can we find this in? Yes, let me answer this question. Is this, you know, was 
included in the section 31, timely use of funds. And you will see the original language is construction contracts must be awarded and executed within six months of construction allocation. That's the original language put in the guidelines. So we just try to explain into details. <laughs> Okay, and I don't see any other questions in the Q and A. Um, I, we have another five minutes or four minutes. So, uh, Neil, I'll let you take it from here, unless anybody has any live questions. And Sherry, do we see any hands? Currently, no, I don't. Sherry Hagos may see something that I don't. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, timeliness is an action. Timeliness of action is definitely a clear takeaway that I got. Um, well done, state programs crew. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, you're, thank you're, you. You, you do so much good for us. And, and obviously, there was plenty of questions that your folks had for you um, in regards to your programs. Um, so, so thank you for joining us. And thank you for being a part of today's program. Um, before we move into closing comments, um, I wanted to acknowledge um, that we have a laundry list of questions in the Q&A dialogue box, uh, many of which we weren't able to get to, and a couple of which point to some nuanced uh, conflicts between federal highway administration and uh, guidelines and, and federal regulations. And you can imagine that there's a couple questions in there that require us to do a little bit more homework. Um, and consultation with our federal partners before we can provide a definitive response to. And those are the kind of things that we just simply do not wanna be winging it um, on the fly in a venue like this. So um, please do, before we disband today, um, peruse the chat and copy links for um, future reference. Um, and then um, be on the lookout for the transcript of today's um, questions and answers. Um, now, before we disband with some closing remarks, um, we still have Dawn with us and we have um, one of the division's managers, Kelly Hobbs, um, with us to provide some closing remarks. But before we do, we still have 253 people online and I'd like to ask you a question and challenge you to engage the chat and provide us with some feedback right now. Here's the question, how did we do today? It's a two-part question. What would you like us to circle back around on and provide you more of next time? Question one. Um, we spent a whole hour on federal aid process and procedure, um, 45 minutes on state programs. Um, there's a lot of nuance in local assistance and maybe even some program areas that we didn't cover in today's program. So question number one, um, please open up your chat and provide a, a response to the following question. What would you like us to circle back around on that we provided today and provide more detail, more examples, more nuance, basically more time on. That's question number one. I'll give you folks um, a, a moment or so to provide your answers in the chat because that really, again, helps us develop these programs. And some of you, while we're waiting for you all to honor us and our instructors with a couple um, suggestions in the chat, um, some of you may be new to the industry, uh, maybe new to your position, uh, maybe to new to local assistance projects in general. So here is your second question. Um, what have we not covered today that would be useful for you if we were to cover in a future session. So again, this helps us build this program and it helps us deliver content that meets your needs. So that's your second question. Um, what did we not cover that you would like us to cover in a future program? So Neil, I do see two people have hands up in the chat, in the participants, uh, Seth Jennison and Mike Costa. We also noted that um, we have folks noting in the Q&A 
uh, that they're saying that the chat is currently disabled. We are working on that right now. Okay, well then, hey, this is all about uh, flexibility, right? We're in a challenging time. So why don't you go ahead and while we try to resolve those tech issues behind the, the scenes, um, we only have a few more minutes left. So go ahead and throw that into the Q&A box if that's still operational for you. Again, we're gonna send out a pre-survey um, for the next time, but since this is fresh and since this is right here and right now, maybe there's a couple of things that you wanted us to cover in a little bit more detail. Maybe you're looking for specific examples. If the chat doesn't work for you and it looks like it's not gonna be able to be fixed live, just go ahead and drop it in the Q&A dialogue box, which is operational, and we're going to be copying that for our transcripts anyway. So just throw it on in there. Um, and, and we really appreciate it. Um, it really helps us key in on how we can meet your needs. And um, while you all are doing that, I want to say thank you to Sac State for hosting us today. Um, Sac State's been an amazing partner for many of our training venues, such as this or the Transportation Cooperative Committee working internally with our DLAEs and for the DLAE Council and so forth. So thank you, big thanks to Sac State, as well as all of our instructors who have you know, corralled a wide ranging set of content for today's program. And, and with that, um, I'll go ahead and while folks are putting their final thoughts into the Q&A box um, in terms of how we can develop a program for you next time, um, turn it over to Don and Kelly to provide some closing remarks. Don, go ahead. All right. Well, uh, especially to the over 200 people who hung in through the whole uh, afternoon today, thank you so much. Thank you again, local assistance, for, for providing uh, this valuable training and all the participants, your feedback, your questions, they really make this uh, valuable for everybody. So it's, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, I do appreciate uh, folks I've heard from already about potentially uh, working towards the next training day, providing some of those best practices and some collaboration. So um, again, I look forward to these continued efforts and thank you again for all the great information today. Thank you, Don, and I, I share um, your comments there. Thank you everybody for joining us today. When we first started this, we, we weren't expecting so many people to join us and and a couple of times at the last minute, it's like, wow, there's a lot of people out there that we, we are uh, working with. So we, we greatly appreciate your time. Um, I know four hours at one stretch can be a lot. And I, I really do know a lot of people would like to get back into the, uh, into the real world <laughs> rather than doing these Zoom things, but we can really, touch, or, you know, we can really um, reach a, lot, a large audience in, in this way. Our next uh, training day, um, we are trying to do this quarterly, so our next training day should be two or three months from now. Um, I would guess I would be April, May, June. Um, one thing, we are looking for volunteers from the RTPA community to join us, uh, to help us set this up, to, to uh, find RTPA members that would be interested in, in presenting um, best practices or, or just other, other things that you can help us with. Um, you know, this is a partnership and um, we, we really appreciate every, everyone's efforts. And I, I'd like to thank Neil too. Neil's been on an assignment, a special assignment for a few months. And he, he, I finally got him back on my staff <laughs> at full time. So thank you, Neil, for, for emceeing today and everybody have a great night. Uh, well, gang, that was the program for today. Um, thank you for joining us. We're going to go ahead and keep this meeting live for a few more minutes so you can go ahead and copy from the chat. Um, those of us, uh, those instructors who are still around are going to take a moment to answer what questions that we can in the chat um, and stay tuned for more. Thanks for joining us, gang. And maybe for Sherry's and Peter, Kelly and Daniel, if you're still available, we can hang back for a minute, just do a very quick debrief um, and look ahead to the next one. I'll stick Thanks. around. <laughs> oh, no. The dogs. The dogs. Yes. <laughs> Those are my dogs. <laughs> <laughs>
and we'll wait for Sherry to put us in the back room. She'll tra she'll transfer us off this call, hopefully. And we can't do a debrief in this setting. They can't kick everyone out. <laughs> okay, so we'll wait until the next 50 people drop off. That was that was fun though. That gave me a flashback to the bumpuses on the Christmas story. I think it was. That was fun. So we'll just hang tough for a minute. But thank you, everybody who's still with us. Um, you're free to enjoy the rest of your afternoon. My niece dropped her dog off, so there's three dogs here right now. <laughs> and a uh, fire truck went by or something, and they just went crazy. <laughs> Well, there they go still i think that beats the one training that i was on and there was construction going on in my house okay so it looks like sherry sherry's going to close this off now and it may drop us all off so if we want to have a post meeting we have to set that up separately if you'd like me to send you all a, a, a link uh for a teams meeting we can do that it's up to you all yeah, I'm available. If if people want to leave, though, we can uh, we can set something up later. Yeah, it's been it's been four hours. I think everybody's ready to go uh, have a nice glass of water. Thank you, and get outside and see the sun. Oh God.